So, good evening everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight to Young Muslims Leaving Islam, the Importance of Free Speech for Apostates. My name is Noam Siboni, and I am the President of Students in Support of Free Speech at York University. And to give you a little bit of a uh, background uh, to the organization that's hosting this event, SSFS, Students in Support of Free Speech, we've been around for approximately one year. Uh, ever since we hosted the free speech rally in support of Jordan Peterson back in last October, we've been upholding the right to speak one's mind, no matter how controversial the idea. Um, and we've been applying that to a university setting, you know, where students uh, live their lives, essentially, where we believe a free market of ideas should take place. We've held multiple events, you know, covering topics such as libertarianism, religion, fiscal policy and economics, freedom of speech, philosophy, and much more. Our goal is to continue advocating for the rights of students and individuals all across the political sphere. And I hope that this event will be a testament to just that. Speaking today will be Ali Rizvi and Armin Navabi. Ali Rizvi is the author of The Atheist Muslim, the book that will be read from today as well as a common contributor to the Huffington Post. He has been writing about secularism and Islam for many years now. Armin Navabi is also an author, publishing his book, Why There Is No God, as well as the founder of the Atheist Republic, one of the largest atheist communities in the entire world, with over 1.6 million followers on Facebook. Ali and Armin also constitute half of the Secular Jihadists from the Middle East podcast, uh, along with Faisal al-Mutar and Yasmin Muhammad, where they discuss topics just like the ones we'll be discussing today. Ali and Armin are also both originally from the Middle East, with Ali living through Libya, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, as well as Armin in Iran. They both host a myriad of complex and intriguing stories to tell, and I'd like to thank them both for coming out, because on the topic of Islam itself, atheism and Islamic attitudes towards certain outgroups is one very concerning to me in particular as my family comes from the North African Muslim country of Morocco. So thank you very much again for coming out. And without further ado, I'll introduce Ali Rizvi with his book, The Atheist Muslim. So thank you for the intro introduction, um, uh, Noam and uh, Priyank and everybody else at um, uh, Students uh, in Support of Free Speech. I think it's a great group. I think it's a very, very important topic right now. Um, free speech is being debated again, as it, it really wasn't before. I mean, it's, uh, we're kind of, in a way, going backwards. And uh, this is something that we have struggled with uh, for a very long time, as people who grew up in parts of the world where um, speaking your mind you know, wasn't a right, it was a crime. And uh, increasingly, I'm seeing that here is becoming a luxury almost. And I think on college campuses uh, nowadays and university campuses in North America, uh, it's becoming an issue. So we're going to deal with some of those topics today. Uh, to start with, I'm going to read from my book, uh, The Atheist Muslim, um, A Journey from Religion to Reason. And uh, this is the beginning of a chapter called Islamophobia Phobia and the Regressive Left. And it's uh, it specifically deals with free speech and uh, the Charlie in the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo attack in, in early 2015. Freedom of speech does not mean the freedom to offend, a born and raised American Muslim friend says to me in reference to the Charlie Hebdo attacks, protesting my telling him that I'm a free speech absolutist. We're at a small party and I'm ideologically outnumbered by a group of young, bright and inebriated American Muslims, all of whom have condemned the shootings but have taken issue with the content of the satirical French magazine, articulating some version of an argument beginning with the words, I believe in freedom of speech, but. On the contrary, I reply, making an argument I sadly have to make too often. Freedom of speech is the freedom to offend. Without the freedom to offend, what is the point of free speech? Indeed, the most transformative revolutionaries throughout history could not have achieved what they did without offending a lot of people. This doesn't just include scientists like Darwin and Galileo, or visionaries like Susan B. Anthony and Martin Luther King Jr. 
It includes Jesus Christ himself, not to mention Muhammad, who was chased out of Mecca for gravely offending the Quraysh, the merchant tribe that ran the city. The conversation now veers towards hate speech. Doesn't hate speech cross the line? Or do you think that should be protected too? I understand why my friend is asking this. Even France, where the attacks happened, has laws against hate speech. Shortly after the attacks, the French comedian Diodonné, is that how it's pronounced? Anybody know? Well, anyway, that's, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, was arrested for Facebook posts sympathetic to the views of the terrorists. And in 2011, fashion designer John Galliano was famously arrested, tried, and fined for anti-Semitic hate speech. Is France right to criminalize hate speech? I don't think so. In the United States, you can deny the Holocaust all you want. You can join the Ku Klux Klan and hold white supremacist rallies with police protection. You can print cartoons of Muhammad, the self-censoring of some American media outlets being a separate matter, and not be prosecuted for it. You can buy Mein Kampf or borrow it from a library. You can join the Westboro Baptist Church and pick at the funerals of slain soldiers with signs reading God hates fags, backed by the full support of an 8 to 1 Supreme Court decision in your favor. In the United States, hate speech is protected as free speech, and for good reason. France, like many other European countries, does not understand free speech. It enforces secularism by banning the wearing of religious symbols. It arrests people like Duodon... Duodon... Okay, I'll just skip that. <laughs> For... I can write it. I can't say it. For non-threatening Facebook posts, as vile as they may be. To me, this feels like more of a Saudi Arabia-Iran thing, and really shouldn't be a France thing. France is inconsistent, an inevitable consequence when you get into the business of legislating what is and isn't hateful. There is a legitimate, though flawed, a debate about why anti-Semitic cartoons are a crime while cartoons offensive to Muslims and other minority groups are considered fair game under free expression. Here, the apologists who say France has double standards on free speech may have a point. France should be consistent. To Islamists, this means France should ban all hate speech. To me, it means France should allow all of it. In case you're wondering why I'm standing up so vehemently for hate speech, I'm not. What I'm standing up for is not letting your government define hate speech for you. That should be your decision, not theirs. The cartoonists at Charlie Hebdo were frequently targeted by the French government itself, which used its hate speech laws to justify telling them what to do. Islamists in the West who denounce infidels and spout jihadist rhetoric in their Friday mosque sermons invoke these hate speech laws to silence any criticism of their beliefs by calling it bigotry or Islamophobia. The supposed parameters of where free speech ends and hate speech begins, an imaginary distinction, are too important for you to let somebody else define them. Criminalizing hate speech like France does infantilizes people. It doesn't just take away someone's right to speak. It takes away your right to form your opinions and response to them. By supporting a ban on hate speech, you're allowing your government to regulate not just what someone can say, but what you can hear. Moreover, banning hate speech is a slippery slope. Consider the following. Deuteronomy 22, verses 20 through 21 say that non-virginal brides should be stoned to death on their father's doorsteps. Leviticus 20.13 says that any two men having sex with each other should be killed. Verses of uh, Surah 5 verses 72 and 73 in the Quran say that anyone who believes in the Trinity or that Jesus is the Son of God is a blasphemer or disbeliever doomed to eternal hellfire. Verse 551 says not to take Jews and Christians for friends. Verse 9, 5 endorses the slaying of polytheists. Is there a doubt in anyone's mind that these ideas would be considered hate speech if voiced by someone today? Yet, these words appear in holy books considered sacred by billions around the world. From a hate speech perspective, which would you say is more offensive? I ask my friend. Those verses? or a Charlie Hebdo cartoon. 
The uncomfortable truth is this. If you really wanted to ban all hate speech, the Bible and Quran would be the first to go. Next would be the preachers who read from them and quote them in their sermons. Without hate speech, freedom of religion can't really exist. I grew up in countries where simply speaking your mind could get you sent to prison, flogged, or even executed. Early on, I promised myself that when I got to a place where I had the freedom to speak, I would. And I wouldn't take my freedom of speech for granted, not even for a day. But when I finally arrived in North America, I saw that things weren't that simple. In countries where Muslims are a minority, Islam is an identity. In countries where Muslims are a majority, Islam is a religion. This dichotomy has consequences for liberals on either side. For the liberal in North America, Islam is the faith of a small minority of Muslims who are often discriminated against and whose rights must be protected, as with any minority group. But for the liberal in a Muslim majority country, Islam is a tool the government uses to justify censorship, oppression, and other illiberal values, like forcing women to wear the hijab, persecuting homosexuals, and publicly lashing bloggers. The same holy book that Muslims in the United States and elsewhere revere as divine and peaceful is used by the governments of Muslim majority countries to endorse everything from domestic violence to the execution of apostates. The hijab, worn proudly by Muslim American women who choose it as a symbol of their identity, is forced on women in many Muslim majority countries by their governments, imams, or husbands. And many criticisms of Islamic doctrine made by liberal reformers and dissidents in Muslim majority countries are labeled Islamophobic when voiced here. It's easy to see how this can get very confusing very fast. In their well-intentioned effort to protect what they see as a targeted minority, West <coughs> excuse me. Western liberals unwittingly find themselves fighting to guard and protect the same backward values that their counterparts in Muslim majority countries are fighting against. My friend Faisal Saeed Al Mutar an Iraqi refugee, writer, and human rights activist puts it best, quote, Many Western liberals have betrayed us liberals in the Middle East and other Muslim countries and sided with the Islamists against us, end quote. As blunt as it sounds, this is a common sentiment among liberals in the Arab and Muslim world, and understandably so. Things become even more complicated when people like Faisal or I come to North America from places like Iraq or Pakistan. There are millions of people living uh, uh, millions of people like us living in the Muslim world that you will never hear from. Even if they want to speak up, they can't because they don't want to put their lives and families at risk. Then there are those who do dare to speak up, but their voices are too often silenced before even reaching us. Consider the case of my friend Raif Badawi, the liberal Saudi blogger who is currently serving a 10-year prison term with a sentence of 1,000 lashes or all the Bangladeshi bloggers who have been hacked to death for writing critically about Islam. Finally, there's a group that Faisal and I belong to. It includes those who have left their countries of birth and now live in societies where free speech is a right, not a crime. We speak out as often as we can for all those back home who can't. My resolve is enormously strengthened by the incalculable number of messages I have received from closeted secularists in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Syria, Malaysia, Bangladesh, and more, asking me to tell the world about something or another that they cannot speak openly about. And I'm sure that this is something that Armin and many of us have experienced as well. We get a lot of those messages. As well-intentioned as, as they may be, Western liberals like Noam Chomsky and journalist Glenn Greenwald have conflated protecting the right of Muslims to believe as they want with protecting the beliefs themselves. This has the inadvertent effect of empowering despots and dictators who are brutally oppressing sizable dissident minorities within the Muslim world, the very people who carry the most promise for reform. And I'll stop it there.
And wh what I wanted to do was quickly introduce Armin to you. So Armin is um, an Iranian, uh, former Muslim, and he actually was, whereas I, I grew up more secular even when I was, when I did dabble in religion here and there, I was, I was still a little bit more liberal. Um, Armin actually went through a fairly fundamentalist phase that got uh, pretty serious at one point. So he grew up in Iran and um, now obviously that's very different and most of you are familiar with Atheist Republic, uh, which is this group. Um, and he has recently been, his group has been the target recently of um, mass reporting um, from like an Islamist groups on Facebook and it has been shut down and banned uh, several times now, but uh, fortunately we've been able to get get it back up online. Yeah, which is so. because of the support of the community. Actually, this shows how limit trying to limit someone's speech usually backfires and you actually give them a um, much larger audience. We experienced that when they took us down every time we came back, we came back uh, larger. So if you are trying to reduce free speech by banning them, you're actually going to help get, get them more support mm -hmm. and make them feel like victims and be able to use it as a way to recruit more people. I always, uh, limiting anybody's free speech is always usually going to backfire. So, mm -hmm. and I, I usually give the example of Sunnah. So I was tell you know that um, Muhammad was actually when he was in Mecca when he first started preaching, um, people didn't like him. Right? They were they chased him out of there. He ran in fear of his life and uh, with a small group of people. And eventually, now, you know, it, it's one of the biggest religions in the world. Yeah, for people who try it. So blasphemy, in a way, yeah. is sunnah. So what we're doing here, <laughs> just following the example of Muhammad. Muhammad got lucky, though. If they didn't get him to write the constitution in Yasrib, he would never. He would just be a small cult and die. Yeah, yeah. Could have cut out. But yeah. Anyway, Ar Armin, do, do you want to go into your? Should uh, I say? I, yeah, sure. I might want to give a different story than that. Um, sure. Um, story because it's about free speech. I just. When I, when I was an ex-Muslim in Iran, one time I got arrested for having a girl in my car. And they arrested me and they asked me, is this your sister? And I was like, no. Nope. They're like, is this your cousin? I was like, nope. Like, are you related in any way? And I was like, no. I like, okay, then you're arrested. I was like, are you serious? Like, I heard it happens to some people. I they couldn't believe that it was happening to me. And they took me to the police station and the, the officer there was lecturing me about how to be a good Muslim and this is not right and I was so tired of him lecturing me at that point he's like well you know what being a good Muslim doesn't really apply to me because I'm not Muslim and the guy was like what uh, yeah I'm not Muslim I'm like but weren't you born a Muslim from a Muslim family I'm like yeah but I changed my mind so <laughs> so what you're saying doesn't really apply to me and that was, I was stupid. That was not the right thing to say. But this guy, actually I appreciate this guy because this guy looked at me and he was shocked and he was like, don't you ever say that to anyone ever again. I can destroy your life right now with the stroke of my pen. He went from lecturing me to all of a sudden being very concerned about how stupid I was and almost getting myself killed. So I really, even though the guy was an asshole, I really appreciate the fact that he cared about my safety at, at that point more than lecturing me. And my mom came to bail me out and he took her in a room and he's like, you need to get your son to shut up. And he told me things that I'm not going to repeat, but go ask him and make sure he never says that to anybody ever again. And I was like, that worked. Like, he scared me. Um, and I realized that you can't just go out and say these things out in the open. So I, when I came to Canada, this idea of nobody not having any consequences for whatever you say was so it, it looked I always felt like there's an eye behind me looking at me right the, the eye of the government and can't there are certain things that you just can't do or say I actually in Iran one time I saw on the internet somebody wrote a letter against Khamenei open letter and I couldn't believe somebody had the balls to write that and I had I was I printed it and I was like, oh my god, I printed this and I have this in my hand, this could kill me. And, but I w it was such a rush and it was in terror. I put it in my bag, school bag, 
and I just went out in the streets and just walked around a little bit and came back home and like I survived this I had this letter that could get me killed and I just went out in the public with it and then I came home and I you know turned apart and I flushed it down the toilet and I'm like what a rush oh my god like but then in Canada I just it just like really I just felt like I could just say anything I could say like fuck Canada like Fuck the prime minister, and nobody can do anything really. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It's just, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. A lot of people don't appreciate here what a unique, you know, freedom that you have that you just get to say things and express whatever you want to express, and there's no consequences for it. That's not how it usually was, and even now, it's a unique thing to have. And a lot of people have sacrificed a lot to be able to have this and people here just think it's a right to just have it and just don't appreciate it they just think it just came to them for free there's so many people that bled or died or lost loved ones for you to be able to enjoy it yeah and you you can actually see that if you look in other places if you look at Raif Badawi um, I don't know if, if everybody here is familiar with Raif Badawi, but Raif Badawi is a Saudi blogger. He's a very good friend of mine. His wife uh, lives in, in Quebec. She's a very good friend of my wife. And, you know, we know that he's got beautiful children and, you know, we're doing everything we can to get him out of there. But he started a website um, called Free Saudi Liberals and he was thrown in prison for uh, insulting Islam. At one point, they were weighing the idea of killing him, but they decided to just give him a 10-year prison sentence and sentence him to a thousand lashes. Uh, the first 50 lashes uh, that he got uh, were administered in January 2015, two days after the Saudi ambassador to France marched with um, the, the, in the Charlie Hebdo. Uh, the, 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 the rally that they had after the Charlie Hebdo attack, and uh, you know, we all went out. There, there, many of us were, were trying to, you know, get him out of prison, and we, we all went out. We did, we did media. We went on TV, and we did everything we could to raise awareness. It became a really, really big story, and uh, then since then, so far, fingers crossed, uh, he hasn't received any other lashes. Uh, so, speaking out does help. You know, applying that kind of pressure, it does help. Unfortunately, he's still in prison. Uh, he's been there now for five years. So he's already served half of his sentence. But um, what, what, what Armin is talking about, about, you know, the, the people who have died in, here in, in the West, people who have died generations ago, who we don't know about, who suffered generations ago, um, just for speaking freely, and you, you don't, they're, they're very distant. You read about them in textbooks. You read about Galileo and, you know, I was thrown in a dungeon or whatever, even though that's not, you know, I think that's partially true. And there's all these rumors that you hear about those things. But you could, you actually have real life examples of what it was like just by looking at uh, some of these, you know, theocratic countries or theophilic countries, you know, people who aren't official theocracies. But there is some theocratic element to their uh, state rule, like, like Turkey, for example, which is supposed to be one of the most progressive, supposedly, Muslim-majority countries in the world. But uh, even there, you know, we've seen recently that, you know, Islamism is making a comeback. So, you know, th those things are important to see. One, one thing I remember personally is that there was a time uh, I, I'd gotten into a religious argument with somebody in Pakistan. I wasn't really out at it. I was just being annoying, like that they didn't think that I was an apostate or anything. I didn't let that on, uh, but they were very angry. And there was this thing happening there. There were bombings on buses, like you know, people would bomb public transport. You could a bomb could go off anywhere. And one thing I remember coming to uh, Canada, and we settled in Mississauga, as as many of uh, our people do, like my people. I have a theory. I think the flight is so long that, you know, they just land. That's where the airport is. They're like, ah, you know, just, I don't want to go anywhere else. Like Toronto's too far. We just, let's just stay in Mississauga. So I remember getting on a bus and I call it the luxury of boredom. I was just sitting on a bus and that was it. I was just sitting on a bus and I was bored and I, it was great. 
Yeah, I didn't have to worry. You know what you're talking about, having an eye yeah. looking over you all the time? Like, so there was, there was no state like that. There was, it was a little, um, you know, so sometimes it's, it's a little hard to get used to. I mean, there are many people who come from those countries here and they're, they're fine. It's normal for them. For, but for, for people who have sort of been at least a little vocal about some of these ideas in those countries, we're kind of used to how serious it can get, like, like the warning that this yeah. guy gave you. And he, he was probably, he may even, do you think he was also a closeted? Um, I just think he was just not that, he, was just not, he didn't want to see this little kid get killed for just saying something stupid. I just, I mean, his humanity came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, a, a lot of people even in Iran don't notice th this because most people there are not activists. They might come here and be like, no, it's, it's fine. We don't mm -hmm. feel any oppression. But well, yeah, okay, we'll go try speaking out yeah. your political. You go try publish your political views against Khamenei, and then come back to me and see what you know. But and another thing, I think I want to push back on is a lot of people here suggest sometimes. I mean, I, tell me if you disagree with that. Us being called bigoted or racist or people calling. It, us Islamophobe or other people Islamophobe or racist or whatever you think they think that we're trying to shut down their you know attack their views this is not against freedom of speech right like no matter how much you get attacked and called names and people you know accuse you of different things because of your views they can do that your freedom of speech is not being limited right mm -hmm. Or also, I think I keep saying like, our, our Facebook tried to take our page down and you know limiting our freedom of speech. That's also not against freedom of speech. That's their private environment. That's their platform that they create. So I I might the reason why I say this is because I think a lot of people try to say that oh this is the same as what Iran is doing or what Saudi Arabia is doing. No. Somebody creating a platform and then telling you you're not welcome on it anymore, they get to do that. When we go to Facebook and we ask them to let us back in, that's a request. It's not a demand. It's not a, freedom of speech does mean the freedom to offend, but it, does, it doesn't mean that you have a right to everyone's platform. Anybody, anybody, if somebody made a platform, they get to tell you to leave. I can't. Just walk into someone's house, you know, a Christian family's house and start shouting at everybody, God is fake. If they ask me to, like, please leave our house, they're like, oh, you're limiting my freedom of speech. You're like, no, you're in our house. You don't get to do that here, <laughs> right? If, if I'm saying that in a park, in a public space, people can shut me up. But in a, if I can't go to a church and start yelling at people, like, you're all fools, or go to a mosque and say, like, I know Muhammad was a pedophile. They are allowed to kick me out. That's their environment, right? But when we make our own platform, you know, we're inviting people to come on our platform. But, you know, we, that's why we have this podcast, Secular Judges from the Middle East, because we're not relying on anybody. We're not relying on Facebook. We're not relying on the, web, uh, on the left or on the right or on anybody. Now we're creating our own media and you know we, we're not waiting for anybody to tell to you know allow us or to ask us to leave from their platform but i just i just want to make sure people when you when we when we tell people that are um calling us names or uh, when we try to suggest that they're limiting our freedom of speech i think we are losing focus from actual people that are lose, that don't have their freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, to give an, a stark example of that again, uh, yeah. Rife, right, is somebody who um, is jailed by the government. It's not a private institution or yeah. a store that he can't go to. This is actually in his own country. It's, it's a crime. He can't, he can't get out of it. Um, so that, that is what curtailing freedom of speech is. And unfortunately, in some places that are secular, like officially secular, like in Bangladesh, um, you know, you have you have other issues. I mean, it's not just a matter of when, when it comes to free speech. There are ways for people to curtail your free speech. I mean, there's one is that 
you know, do you suppose you can execute somebody? That's, you know, a punishment for atheism, for instance, in 13 countries, all of which happen to be Muslim majority. Um, the other is that if even if you, you don't execute them yourself, you, you throw them to the mob, right? And that is not illegal. I mean, it's, it's illegal to kill somebody. But that is something that we do see a lot in Bangladesh. We saw this, um, another friend of mine, Avijit Roy, um, he was, I mean, there, were, there were a series of bloggers in Bangladesh who were actually hacked to death, either in their homes or in the case of Avijit, out on the streets of Dhaka when he was walking with his wife. Um, and, you know, this, this also happened around 2015. And I thought that he was the first of several bloggers in Bangladesh, secular bloggers who were hacked to death. Most recently, we had this horrific case of uh, Mashal Khan, who was a uh, Pakistani. Um, he wasn't even an out-and-out -out declared atheist, but he was pro-secularism. And uh, he, was, he was mobbed and shot and stomped on and just brutally beaten to death, you know, not by religious people in a mosque, but by university students, like his own university students. Um, there were police who showed up there. They came late. Many of them actually defended the beating. So you had law enforcement that endorsed it. After, um, I think, one of the Bangladeshi bloggers, once after he died, uh, the prime minister of Bangladesh came out and she said, that well, you know, you shouldn't insult religion. So she, in a way, justified it. You know, of course, they'll say, you know, we don't endorse the killing, but you know, he really shouldn't have done what he did. Uh, so they were blaming the victim. So there are many ways to do it to curtail uh, the speech of people um, that threatens them. All of them are not necessarily government endorsed, right? But uh, you know, and and here, one thing I say here is that you know, you have the. Islamophobia smear, all of these people, like Raif Badawi is a hero for a, a lot of the liberals here, mm. right? Afjit Roy was a hero for a lot of the liberals here. Uh, you know, as long as a secular activist is in a Muslim-majority country, and as long as he's imprisoned, he's a hero. But you free the same guy, and you bring him here, and he says the exact same words, Islamophobe. So, what you have is, and one thing I, I say in the book is that over there, they had blasphemy laws to force us into silence, over here you have the Islamophobia smear to shame us into it, right? So um, there are many ways uh, to, to curtail it, and yes, it's not a matter of legality uh, the entire time, but there, there are people who are sneaky who come up with more covert ways um, to censor you. So, so. so even when, when I say like that's not against your freedom of speech, it doesn't mean that it's not wrong. Of course, it's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. It's it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. but it might it's not against your freedom of speech. But still, ridiculous. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and it's a, I, I I agree with you. It's completely yeah. fair. If, if there's a million people, if I say something and you know I, I write this book and a lot of people, I, I get it all the time. I was just always told, you know, you're a uh, you're an Islamophobe or you know how much are the how much are the Jews paying you? Yeah. And I was again. I was like, we're still waiting for our checks. Right I haven't. I would be so rich. Yeah. Um, like no, the Jews, Mossad, CIA, Rod. Nobody's paid me. Half Post hasn't doesn't pay its bloggers. I mean, of all people, I'd get them to pay me first. But um, yeah. So you know, the people will say these things, and and they label you that, and that is their freedom of speech. So uh, when I say that they try to shame you into silence, I'm saying that I'm. I, I'm, I'm relatively immune to that, uh, but there are many people who aren't. There's many people who, the, the, I, I get, one of the most common things I get is from white people, liberal, progressive white people, you know, like people who support Bernie Sanders and, you know, all this stuff. Like they'll, you guys, they're like, I, I agree with you. I like what you're saying. I can't say it because there's no way I'm saying this in public. Yeah. Like they, they'll say that to me. You know, they're like, I'm really glad you're doing this event because there's, there's no way I'd say it, but I agree with you. I actually had somebody same day, say the exam, same thing to me in the yeah. non-conference, and I told him, that's actually racist, because you're saying that you have to be brown to be able to say certain things. This is 
racist against white people. You're saying if you're white, you can't say certain certain things. Oh, but do you know there's no, it's impossible to be racist against white people because no, they you, were colonizers, apparently. So. No, but but uh, like you don't you it's don't hard need being white nowadays. Is, that, <laughs> is it what? Yeah. No, I, you don't need to. I mean, you don't need to be brown to be able to see that Islam is bullshit. You don't need to. <laughs> You don't need to be, and people are like, oh, well, you're an ex-Muslim, I have an experience with Christianity, I don't have an experience with Islam. I'm like, just read the Quran. It, you know, really, you need, to, you need to be an ex-Muslim to know that there is no flying horse that Muhammad was on that went to heaven. Like, you don't need to be a genius to figure out that these are claims without evidence. You know, you could spend 30 minutes reading the Quran and be like, yeah, okay, where's your evidence for all these claims? That's all it takes. You don't need to be an ex-Muslim for 20 years to figure it out. And you not talking about it is helping more people being labeled as bigots that do talk about it. Like, if more people, if more white people talked about it, instead of just letting people, oh, I'm, I'm not the right color to talk about it. If you, if, well, if you, t if you talk about it, you're letting other people not be labeled like because you're making you're normalizing it so just openly saying it and not being worried about being called a bigot is normal is normalizing it and you know it's the best way to do it is basically criticize islam and just be nice to muslims at the same time right so you say like, come from a friendly place it's just a disagreement i'm, I'm not well, i'm don't hate anybody i'm just disagreeing with you there's a, a one uh, there's a story that faisal our friend <coughs> who's the iraqi you know, we've got the Iraqi and the Iranian. They get along as long as they're, <laughs> they're the same religious beliefs. They, uh, they have, um, he tells a story where he, he asked uh, somebody in an audience, I think he had somebody ask him a question about, I can't remember the exact story, but he asked him, he said, he said you know, what would you call somebody, you know, a Republican who, who thinks um, that, uh, that gay people should not, be, uh, should not be able to get married? Or who opposes, you know, homosexuals, and uh, he said, "Well, I'd call them a bigot." He's like, "Well, you just called a significant percentage of Muslims bigots," right? and he's like, "Oh, no, no, that's not what I meant." So, it a, so there is a the, the one of the downsides of this, and, and this is this fear, and this is actually what I call Islamophobia phobia. He's like, they. The fear of being labeled Islamophobic, the fear of being bigoted, and this is happening to a lot of Western liberals, especially white Western liberals, is um, the, the downside of it is that liberals now, um, their ideology or the ideas that they had and the values have gotten diluted. And here's how. You know, there's been an embracing of diversity, like part of the liberal consciousness is, is diversity. You know, everybody's equal. Uh, doesn't matter what color you are, what 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 creed, what race, whatever. We're, we're all, we all should have equal opportunity. This is this is the face of the world that we want right now, and that's great. The only problem is that the diversity, the part of the diversity equation that they're missing is a diversity of ideas. So you have somebody like Donald Trump who says something incredibly misogynistic, or you know a Tea Party Republican says something that is really homophobic. And um, everybody will jump on them. Right? Even even a religious Christian, evangelical Christian, can say something that's uh, you know racist or anti-Semitic or homophobic or whatever, and they'll jump on them, and everybody will essentially you know descend on that person. Um, all the liberals will. You find the same thing in the Quran, and you see Muslims doing it, and gotta back off. We have to respect their beliefs. It's another culture. So this, first of all, is bigotry. It's a bigotry of lowered expectations. You're holding uh, Muslims to a lower standard. But it also means that the same idea, the same bad idea, you're going to attack if it's said by this party, but you're not going to protest it when it's said by another party. And when that happens, it's not about ideas anymore. It's only about identity. And that necessarily lends itself to identity politics. So now you have, uh, for instance, in um, uh, like in, in the United States, right? For instance, you know, the, the black people overwhelmingly vote Democrat, but in a lot of black churches, they're very conservative. Uh, there are a lot of homophobic attitudes, more so than the regular population. You know, the in the Latino population, another minority, um, they happen to be that there's that there are a large percentage of them that are actually pro-life. 
right? So they're they're aligned. They're they're very conservative when it comes to their values, but they all vote Democrat, and you know they. So the Democrats sort of embrace all of these different identity groups, even though their values, are, the Muslims, right? Their values are very very conservative, and when you have that, it's just not about values anymore because now you have a. Um, you're willing to accept everything. It's bad when one person says it. It's okay and acceptable when a minority says it because we have to protect them. And uh, suddenly it's not about ideas. It's about identities. And, and the only people who have some set of values and ideas is now the right. And, they're, and, that's, and a lot of those ideas are crazy. Many of them on the far right. But at least there's some consistency. You know, there's some sort of coherence to it. And that's, that's what people... Um, are attracted towards. So, so I think that has a lot to do with uh, right now what we're seeing is uh, the descent of, of the left and the liberals well, I do, I, or the political spectrum in general. I do think that a lot of a lot of the far right problem with Islam is also identity. So I don't, I, you know, you know, they might not even care about Islam. It's mostly Muslims they're mm -hmm. upset about. So I don't know if we should give them that much credit for being against oh, yeah. Islam? I, yeah, I, because the, 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 attack, like, the attacks that Muslims get from them, ex-Muslims also get the same attacks the same. from them because they don't care what you believe in. No, no, you're right. You're yeah. right. I, that's a, a wide, by that, I didn't mean to say that yeah. you know the left has yeah. got descended into identity, so the right is now perfectly fine. Yeah. I'm just saying that there is some coherence. There's some basic things that they stand for. But to give an example of the point you just made, um, the you know the the right and uh, Republicans in the U.S. were always very very against uh, gay people, right? They just were not into LGBT rights. They thought it was unnatural. Rick Santorum compared it to bestiality and pedophilia, and you know all they said outrageous stuff about it. But then, when a Muslim guy went and killed many gay people in Orlando, mm. suddenly, you know they were all pro LGBT. It's like these are gay, you know, this Muslim guy came in and this ISIS guy, they want to kill LGBT, they want to kill our lifestyle. It's like, you hated this lifestyle just two months ago. Yeah. Right? But now you're okay with it because, um, you know, it's, it's like, who do I choose? My God, it's a Muslim killing gay, gay people. Like, what do I do? I didn't like either of them, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the gay but, people now. No, but, but even on their anti, like, forgetting all their other ideas, I'm, I'm, what I think is, what I, I might be wrong, but... What I see a lot is that even under anti-Islam stance, it's not coming from a disagreement with your ideology point of view. Is more a xenophobic kind of. I'm a lot. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, there's if it's no. You're you're right. There's a, yeah. there's definitely definitely. I mean, there's you've got sort of white identity politics on one side, and then yeah. you have brown black identity politics on the other. You you do have that. Yeah. So uh, basically, everybody's screwed. You know, we're the only <laughs> right ones here. Yeah, that's it. No, um, no, I, th I think that that's it. and and this is one of the problems. I mean, we have we constantly get pressure. It's like, well, the left has betrayed you. You know, the liberals are now uh, they're they're siding with the Islamists against you, as Faisal has said. You know, and, and rightly so. So there is this expectation for some reason that uh, I, that I'm going to be I have to like Trump. Because, you know, Trump said, Muslim ban, and hey, you wrote a book that criticizes... I'm like, yeah, I said that there's a difference between Islamic ideology and Muslim identity. My entire family hmm. is Muslims. My relatives and friends are Muslims. There's, there's a... There's a um, the, the, this is a very, very important distinction. This is, this is uh, one of the themes of the book. Um, and I, I, this is an example I give a lot to explain this. And it's an article that Fareed Zakaria... You're familiar with Fred Zakaria, the uh, the journalist. So he he wrote in um, the Washington Post, and this is a few days after Trump announced his Muslim ban, and not not the watered down Muslim ban he has now, six countries, and, but this was back when he said a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. So when he did that, um, Fred Zakaria wrote an article called "I Am a Muslim." That was, that was the title, and he said that I am a Muslim. And then he goes on, he's like, my views on faith range between deism and agnosticism. I haven't been to a mosque in decades. My wife is Christian. I haven't raised my children as Muslims. You know, I don't, uh, he hasn't prayed. He hasn't done anything. So he essentially is a non-believer. 
but he was embracing the Muslim identity. And that makes you wonder what the word Muslim means. Does it mean the same thing that it did 1400 years ago? You know, because a lot of people, whether, I mean, you can look up the dictionary, you're like, no, a Muslim is part of someone who believes in Islam, this is what it is, and you can put out your tweet and say, this is, you know, I'm sorry, anybody disagrees with this. You know, it's about, but in reality, when you're having this conversation, um, and when people are using the word Muslim, and everybody's using it in a different context, you know, we have to understand what we're talking about. The definition of these terms is, is very important. So, you know, people, I, I, I tell people, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I don't support Trump at all. You know, he, he goes against everything I stand for. And I don't support Islam at all. That has, that value system goes against everything I stand for as well. And this is what I care for is truth. Right? I, Trump may have some good points on Islam. He may be right about it. But I also care about truth when it comes to claims about other religions, when it comes to science, when it comes to, uh, you know, climate change, like what happened today, he pulled out of the Paris Accord, um, when, when it comes to civil rights right, and equality and a lot of those, those other fundamental values. I mean, there's a whole range of things. I'm not going to take this one issue and part of that one issue and then align myself with somebody just because of it. I mean, the, the reason that I do this, 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 this book, or anything that I'm saying here, what we say about religion, it's not just about the religion. It's about wanting to know what's true. It's about, it's about taking claims and adopting claims and believing claims only when there is evidence for them. It's about critical thinking. It's about the scientific method, right? Do you, um, do you mind if I challenge? <laughs> do you want to challenge the scientific method? Okay, no, let's go. The, the word, the yeah. word Muslim, the usage of oh, the word sure. Muslim. Because yeah, yeah, go ahead. I do. I mean, I. I mean, I like the title of this book because it's an. It's like a. It was originally intended as an intentional oxymoron, right? Oh, yeah, my publisher loves it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the title because it was people like, what the hell? And that's why it grabs people's attention. It's a brilliant title. But I think we also, but I also want to make sure that the word Muslim, like Fareed Zakari is one guy, right? But I do think... No, I, I was using him as an example. Example, but I do think people that would use the word Muslim as just an identity because... The word Muslim is mostly about a, a belief, right? And most Muslims around the world disagree on so many things, but there's some fundamental principles and views that doesn't change among them. Right. And I don't think Fari Zakaria has those beliefs. No, he doesn't. And I would think that he's misdefining the word Muslim. Because the vast majority of Muslims around the world believe in Allah and Muhammad as his prophet and Quran as the word, direct word of God and Qiyamat. I, I talked to... Qiyamat is like the day of judgment. It's a afterlife. Uh, the day of judgment and, uh, and angels. And, so. and th these, are, these are some core beliefs that even the most fringe Muslim groups that usually other Muslims go like, you're not really Muslim or, you know, even Ahmadi or Ismaili or Baha'is. I ask them, like, do you believe that not believing in these will make you not Muslim? And they're like, okay, yeah, there, there is a line. If you don't believe that Muhammad was the prophet of God, if you don't believe in the Quran as a direct word of God, then you're crossed the line now. You're not a Muslim anymore. I mean, if the word Muslim could mean anything to anybody, then it doesn't mean anything at all, right? So if there is any definition for the word Muslim, and you know, the, the thing is that in, in Islam, you could, you know that the word Muslim is a bad belief because the moment that you become a Muslim is when you say the Shahada, right? And you testify that, you know, Allah is God and Muhammad was prophet. Or the moment you come out of a Muslim woman's <laughs> Or that. Yeah, yeah. But at some point, you have to say those words. When it comes to percentages. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we you, get your point, though. Yeah. But, yeah, but if you're, if you're non-Muslim, you say those words, you become a Muslim. So this means that it's about belief. You can't say... So 
if you uh, if you believe in Allah and Muhammad as prophet and don't go to a mosque, don't pray, drink alcohol, have sex before marriage. As long as you believe in those things, you're still Muslim. You're not a good Muslim, <laughs> but you are a Muslim. If you pray in a mosque, fast, do all the things that Muslims do, but don't believe in those things, you're not a Muslim. And this is according to most Muslims in the world. The way I, I see the word used in this title is mostly a cultural Muslim. So, not a Muslim, right? The, the reason why I like this book is because it's telling a lot of people that you could leave Islam and still keep the parts of it that you enjoy. Because a lot of people were offering the reform movement as an in-between. Between, you know, leaving the belief system but keeping the parts of your identity that you enjoy. But that was, that's an intellectually dishonest position to have because I don't, want, I don't know, if, know if you want to get into that. I do think that people like Ali are more honest about, you know, it's more intellectually honest when they look at the Quran and like, okay, no, this is this bullshit. But you could still enjoy Ramadan if, if it floats your boat, right? You know, if you could still... <laughs> if I mean, there's... Yeah. There's, like, free food being given out in places right now. We're here. We need to provide free food at our next <laughs> event, just so... This is one place where they're definitely going to win. So, I mean, it's not a sexy title, but to me, this book is The Atheist Cultural Muslim, right? That's just not sexy, so I like the title the way it is. But I think that's a much better alternative to what the reform movement is suggesting which is to keep Islam you have to lie to yourself about what these verses mean mm -hmm. I think this position and this book whoever reads it like you can be honest about calling bullshit bullshit and still enjoy whatever you enjoyed about your culture or whatever you enjoyed about your identity you could be you don't have to we already had that with Jews and Christians we don't oh, have. Yeah, I mean, the people that celebrate Christmas, they do Easter eggs. They do go all to that church thing. for their wedding, but they don't believe in Jesus. So, if you don't believe Jesus was God, you're not a Christian. That's well, the definition. Richard Dawkins, actually, who's like the as atheist as atheist can get, apparently, um, is uh, you know you talked about how he sang Christmas carols. Yeah. And uh, in church on, on Christmas, and he described himself as a cultural Christian. But I'm going to just quickly defend the title of this book. We've had this conversation before. Yeah. So th this is, uh, there were, so for, first of all, you're right. If this was about, you know, there's a spectrum of Muslims who look at it more as an identity without the burden of ideal, that wouldn't be a good title. It wouldn't fit on the cover of the book, <laughs> first of all. The second thing is, um, there is a sort of facetious, sarcastic uh, aspect of this that deals with cherry picking. That's one angle, is that I actually had a friend who, who des described herself as a feminist Muslim. And um, I thought that was sort of like being a Jewish Nazi. And, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> and then uh, I, was I was joking with her. I'm still friends with her. And she said that, well, you know, I, everybody cherry picks. Like, I don't, I've seen the verses. She was very honest about the verses in the Quran that troubled her as a woman. And she didn't apologize for it. She didn't say, no, actually, you know, the word for dog means, the word for pig means dog. So, you know, we can eat pepperoni. It's okay. As long as it, it wasn't, there was no justification of the scripture or anything like that. Um, she was honest about it. And uh, I, I, I've met LGBT Muslims. And it, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, I always found contradictions. So, you know, when they said that, you know, we all cherry pick, I'm like, well, can I cherry pick all the way to non-belief? And I'll just keep the things that I like, like the food at Iftar and Ramadan and uh, Eid and all the celebrations and my good times and my family and uh, so on, and just reject the belief and I'll become an atheist Muslim. That was one part of it. But the main thing about this is that in Muslim-majority countries, and I, I want to actually put this out there, uh, there, was a, there was a poll done by Wynne and Gallup. It was, it was like a, a, a well-reputed uh, polling a agency. And they did, inter they did uh, surveys on religiosity around the world. 
And um, they found that there are many people in the Muslim world. If you add them up in the numbers, percentages are small. Add them up in the numbers, there are millions of people who identify as atheists. Just to give an example, the number of people in the U.S. who identify as confirmed atheists, according to this poll, was 5%. The percentage of people in Saudi Arabia who identify as confirmed atheists, according to this poll, is 5%. Right? Saudi Arabia has a population of about 20 million people. That's about a million confirmed atheists in Saudi Arabia. The people in Saudi Arabia, and I grew up in Saudi Arabia, so I know that, you know, no, again, nobody talked about it the way that you did to that gentleman who told you not to. Um, but I knew many of them who were like-minded. Uh, so they, the, the number of people who described them themselves as non-religious in Saudi Arabia was 19%. In Italy, that number was 15%. And this is, this is just some of the statistics I, I, I point out. There are other polls um, that have shown slightly different numbers. But the fact is that there are millions of closeted secularists, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, humanists in the Muslim world who publicly have to identify as Muslims. On their passports, you know, my Pakistani passport has my religion on it. Mine too. Yep, it says uh, the Iran, same thing. And so, well, same not, the pass not the passport, the uh, identity card, yeah. 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 And it says uh, Islam. So I, I am a, technically a Muslim, you know, when it comes to my legal documentation in Pakistan. Um, so you, you ha that's the reality for a lot of closeted secularists in the Muslim world. That is the atheist Muslim. It's like the, these are atheists who, for all purposes in terms of their names and publicly and on their passports and the fact that they can't say who they are and in places like Saudi Arabia they're forced to go to Jummah Per and you'll see them in mosques, you'll see them everywhere they're front, as far as you know they're Muslims and when people like Donald Trump put up a Muslim ban they're all included in it because they have those names, that's what it says on their passports so it's not only their own governments and their own societies and their own fundamentalist groups that don't let them shake off the Muslim label. It's also people like Donald Trump who don't let them shake off the Muslim label. So it's, it's very hard to hear from them. So that has, that, that's actually, I think, the, the connotation of this title that I find but that to me is actually most hard to yeah, And uh, for a very long time, I thought that the only people that, the only atheists that are called Muslim, this Muslim title was forced on them because I couldn't imagine somebody leaving Islam and still enjoying anything about Islam. Well, I, mean, it, I didn't know there was an option. I, yeah. Well, no, but what I'm saying is that for many of, ex like many years ago, somebody came to me and said, like, you know, we have cultural cr Christians that don't believe and cultural Jews that don't believe. What if we have that about Muslims? Uh, that, at that time, I thought, like, yeah, that's never going to happen because most people that leave Islam want nothing to do with Islam. They're so scarred. Like w one of our co-hosts, a secular jihadist from the Middle East, whenever Faisal, when he was reading the Quran, she had to take off her headphone because she was so yeah. scarred from this religion that she couldn't even stand hearing yeah. the verses. So I, I, can I just explain yeah. who she is and her story? So the Secular Jihadist from the Middle East is our is a podcast that we do. There's four of us. You should listen to it. Yeah, no. <laughs> there's, uh, there's myself, there's Armin, Faisal al-Mutar, the Iraqi guy. And then the, the fourth one is, is um, uh, this woman, Yasmin. Her name is Yasmin Muhammad. Um, so she actually grew up in a way that we didn't. Uh, there's a book by Phil Zuckerman. You know, called, I think it's called Living the Secular Life, uh, where he talks about uh, mild apostasy, and transformative apostasy. So I can sit here and I can say, well, you know, I like the iftar, the food at Ramadan, I want to keep that. That's okay for me because my parents were relatively moderate, progressive, or liberal. They never forced me to fast. But there are many people like her who was forced and who was literally starved by her parents um, into fasting. So she was, she was forced into it. She also wore the niqab and the full burqa since she was a child. When she was 20, she was forced into a marriage uh, to an Al-Qaeda operative who was actually involved and who had dealings with the people who planned 9-11, personally trained by bin Laden in Afghanistan, 
right now he's in jail in Egypt. There's a Wikipedia page on him. Um, and she was married to him. She had a child with him. So her daughter is, uh, you know, from him. And uh, she eventually busted out of that. And, and this, this, by the way, this, she grew up in Vancouver. This all happened here in Canada. She went to Islamic schools and everything. And um, she eventually busted out of it. She went to university. Uh, she's not in touch with her family anymore, obviously. Um, and uh, now she does a podcast with us. So she, she's got an incredible story. But for her, right, that's more of the example of transformative apostasy. Uh, for her, when she sees the Women's March and she sees people celebrating the hijab, for instance, that triggers her because she fought for years and years to not be able to wear it, to be able to climb out of that piece of cloth. Um, and yes, there are many people who choose to wear it. That's fine. She didn't. So when, when she sees this being celebrated as a symbol of feminism, that's something that triggers her. And when Faisal, we had a, you know, when he was quoting something from the Quran, and when she hears it, she finds that traumatic as well. She went through, you know, years of abuse from her family, from her husband and everything uh, because of the religion. So there are people like that who've been scarred. For it. And it's, but it's not just Islam. I mean, one of my friends, Nate Phelps, who some of you know, is the son of Fred Phelps, who was the founder of the Westboro Baptist Church. And some of this, I mean, he, I, I spoke with him in Alberta um, at a conference. And he had this, he had a riveting talk on how his family um, and how his father used the Bible and scripture to justify just horrifically abusing his children and essentially destroying his family. Um, so, um, you know, th this, is, this is a very serious thing for a lot of people. I know in a lot of ways, because my family was relatively liberal, I know yours and Fessel's were too, yeah. Unlike yeah, so I was the best teacher in our household. So yeah, I was he, he was the guy who was preaching Islam to his parents, right? <laughs> and the other way around, so, not what you see in the movies. Yeah, um, but so. but but the point I'm trying to make is like a lot of most ex Muslims that I met are disgusted by Islam. They mm -hmm. don't like I until until I met you and people like you. I didn't know that there is a large group of people that want to keep some of the. You know, experience because it's like sh Shia ex-Muslims and there's Sunni ex-Muslims. I'm Shia like, ex-Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, sectarianism. <laughs> you never, 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 never leaves it. Yeah. No, but but n when you see there's a, I mean, I think a lot of atheists in general when they leave religion they go through this angry atheist phase because they're like so pissed that they were lied to for so many years and they wasted so much so much on it and they're like I figured this out and this is all bullshit and they just go through this phase and I think for many ex Muslims that phase is a little bit longer. I mean I never thought I would ever when once I was Islam wasn't forced on me in education system anymore. I never thought when I came here I would ever go back to picking up the Quran and the hadith. Like if you told me that one day I'm gonna go reread all of this stuff I was like, are you kidding me? Why would I ever waste my time with such bullshit? But now, once you go through that angry phase, I'm actually going back, and I actually enjoy Islam as an atheist much more than I ever did as a Muslim. Bec I mean, once I mean, but that's kind of not fair to all the people that are being hurt by it. You know, the, the people that are enjoying the Mayan history and Mayan religion and culture, they like they, Nordic mythology and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean they don't they don't condone a human sacrifice. They not they don't believe in any of that bullshit, but it's much more enjoyable as a fantasy and uh, when when nobody takes it seriously. And I think Islam would have been a fun thing to study if people didn't actually think it was real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and now that when I'm going, I mean, it's a lot of these hadiths and Quran and how they interact with it, it's like a puzzle that it could be solved. And a lot of scholars don't actually study these honestly because, you know, it's dangerous to be honest about, you know, you know the way that the Bible has been dissected by so many scholars around the world, secular scholars, 
and it's the mis you know the the theories that they have about every single I mean it, there is most of the studies on the Quran and Hadith is mostly by Islamic scholars and they obviously biased about what they say but if they could the people that have started doing that with the Quran they, it's actually very fun the way that when you read it and I I just think like we're missing out by by not studying Islam as atheists. Well, the, the, it's like it's like that with Christianity too. I mean, you you uh, when you read the Bible and you don't believe in it, it's it's actually really interesting because many of the things you see. I mean, uh, so much of the art and the literature and every and this applies, you know, here for Christianity over there applies for Islam. So many things in the culture, you know, you wouldn't understand if you if you didn't know the history of the religion, right? So. I, I wanted to uh, sort of just uh, bring up one more point about something that he said that I thought was important, um, and then we'll open it up to Q and A. I want to say something after about what you said. After okay, then, then, yeah, then okay. we'll do yeah. then we'll do that, and then after that, I, we'll open it up to Q and A. I, I what what Armin talked about the 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 adjustment phase. You know, when people leave and they go through this angry phase, and you see this with a lot of uh, people who have left, uh, and not only Islam but any other religion, especially if they've had very um, strict, strictly religious households and strict upbringings, like he asked it. And, and this is something that, it's a sociological phenomenon called anomie. That's A-N-O-M-I-E. Um, and I've discussed it in my book as well. And I illustrated it with this example that I once went to a, uh, an Eid party, right? It was an ex-Muslim Eid party. And these are all people who had very conservative families. They had all been disowned by their families. And uh, they had there's a there's a dish called halim in in South Asia. It's it's, it's really good. It's delicious. They made it out of pork. That pork halim. They had pork biryani. Uh, they had all these sort of like South Asian things. Everything had bacon in it. Everything had pork. Like it was disgusting. Like I have, you know, and and you know you see this. You know, people they'll they'll leave the religion and. Suddenly, if you have somebody who was never allowed to talk to boys, you know, she'll suddenly go and, um, or, or he'll suddenly go and start just sleeping with people for no reason, even if they don't really like it, or they'll just put bacon on everything and they'll just get drunk. I mean, you, you know, you tell them, you're like, okay, let's just calm down. It's okay. <clears throat> but this is a phase that a lot of them go through because uh, th this isn't just a matter of, you know, the, it, it's really fascinating. You change your mind, you change your opinion about something, and you lose your parents, you lose your childhood friends. Um, depending on where you are, you can be imprisoned, you can be mobbed uh, and beaten to death, like Michelle Khan was. Uh, you can be executed by your government, and as if all of that wasn't enough, you know, you in a way lose your sense of identity. All of the values that you were taught, suddenly that entire value system, that moral compass is ripped out from under you and you have to build it up again. And that is not something that happens immediately. It takes time. You know, people have to gradually build it up. And the cultural element of it, even people who apostatize in a transformative way, um, they, it's still there. This party that I went to was still an Eid party. On Eid, these kids that were used to being with their parents, who they now were angry at and don't speak to anymore, but they were still, they still wanted to sell them. Now, this was their family of ex-Muslims, and, and they, were, uh, they were still celebrating the Eid thing. It was just still sort of a cultural element to it. It was a nostalgia. So it is, there's so many layers to it. Like, you know, this is, is it cultural? Is it religious? Is it ideology? Is it, it's it's very very complicated. It's not as simple as saying that um, I just want to change my mind. It's it's such a unique thing that just to change your mind and to think differently, um, you know, you're there's so much to lose, and it's terrifying for a lot of people. And it's um, there's a very high cost to letting go. It's not easy. So whenever you know, you feel frustrated at, you know, someone who's believing, you know, someone who's like sort of being defensive of their faith <clears throat> and they don't want to let go. You know, they may be wrong, you may be right, but it's always good to understand what their cost is, you know, what they're faced with, what they stand to lose. It's not, 
easy for everybody to just immediately say, well, this is right, this isn't right. You know, there's a, we are rational people as human beings, we have a rational side to us, but there's a very big irrational side to us too. So, um, and I've noticed that when I, when I do communicate with people and I lock down that identity and I'll go to an iftar party and I'll talk to people, I'm like, you know, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, you know, I snuck a beer, it's in the trunk of my car, and they'll laugh, and it's a joke, and they know I've been there, they know I've done this, they're religious, and there's relatives, and so on. Um, once I lock that down, and they know that, you know, when it comes to the Muslim identity part, I'm with them, I've been through it, you know, I, I, I know their story, I know, I know what drives them, um, then I can criticize the ideology after that's been locked down, and they're more receptive to it. And that's, it's, it's amazing to me that that happens every single time, is because then they don't take it as an attack on their identity. They just look at it as a discussion about ideas. And I think that's sort of the important thing to establish. And Armin, do you have yeah, the last words before? Two small points before. These are not good last points, it's just interesting things to say. <laughs> but um, part of the reason why I don't... Um, feel the Muslim identity as strongly as Ali does. It's because in, in Iran, there's a competing identity, which is a national, nas nationalist, oh, anti... Sorry, I, I don't feel the Muslim identity strongly at all. We relate uh, but you, I you understand acknowledge it. it. Yeah. You understand it better. Um, the, in Iran, for example, all these aids that you mentioned in um, Islam, the, oh, we, a lot of the Iranian nationalist people, they think like the Islamic... Um, holidays are all about death, especially in Shia, it's death of this imam, death of that imam, always about crying or always about being sad. But the nationalist Iranian um, holidays are all about Eid al Nuruz, it's about life, it's about, you know, spring and all this. So they, they and so in Iran, they, on the liberal class, the nationalist, you know, Zoroastrian, ancient Zoroastrian identity was pushed on us a little bit more than the Islamic identity. So, you know, we always were like, ew, Muslim is dark and, is, you know, black and deaf and this imam died and that, you know, Hussein was always, you have to always cry and so, you know. <laughs> but another thing that um, Ali mentioned was um, about, you know, shaming people to silence. One thing I note, another way that they do that is, I notice, you know, an Atheist Republic, you post nine things about Christianity and people and you see the comments and people are like yeah you know yeah like Christians are so stupid this is dumb how could anybody believe this and you post and people like laugh and just joke like and then you post one thing about Islam like all religions are like that like why are you singling out Islam like what well you think Christianity is not just as bad like oh it's Quran well have you read the Bible the Bible is just as violent like it's like going to somebody to a speech about global warming is like why are you not talking about cancer? Don't you think cancer is just as bad? <laughs> like, yeah, cancer is bad, but this is a speech about global warming. Like, what does that get, you know, you, do I have to talk about all the bad things at the same time? Can't I, can I be specific for about this religion? But, and it's, this is among atheists also. It's not, it's not Muslims always coming and fighting us. It's atheists. Every time you post about Islam, you have that one or two comments that were like, all religions are the same. Why are you talking singling at Islam? But you never get that on the Christianity posts. When you post about Christianity and you make fun of Christianity, nobody could like, why are you singling at Christianity? They are accepting it. Like, yes, yeah, you know, bullshit. So, so it's, yeah, it's true. All religions are bullshit, but the fa it well, seems I, I like actually do get that, the Christianity thing a lot, because I, for some reason, tend to have, I have a significant percentage of my followers who are, Trump supporters. Yeah. And I, I can't believe I haven't driven them away yet. I, it's just amazing. They're just, You're trying hard. They're just like, well, you know, I could shoot somebody in Fifth Avenue. No, I'm kidding. The, the, um, but they, they do that. Like, if I say anything about, um, like, you know, once just the absurdity of Christianity. Because someone asked me, like, well, have you ever thought of Christianity? And I, I said, um, and like, it's strange to me because, you know, you've got, it doesn't make sense. Jesus comes, he knocks, and knocks on your door, and you open it, and you're like, yeah, what? And he's like, let me in. Like, why should I let you in? It's like, because I can save you. Like, what are you going to save me from? It's like, I'll save you from what I'm going to do to you if you don't let me in. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me, just fundamentally. But I, I'll say that. And then they'll be like, well, what about Islam? I, yeah, wow, that, I've never heard that. Before. What yeah, about it? That's good. That's good. That they, but I do Equality. think... Equality. I, I just do think that 
Islam does get a special protection. So sometimes I think like the reason why I talked about Islam a, a little bit more than Christianity is because I think the, sh the sh protection around that is a little bit stronger. So maybe it deserves a little bit more attacking at, at, at the ideology just to, to make it normal, normalize it a little bit more. And it has more, it, it is actually... Just the idea that, I mean, there was a time when Christianity was the most dangerous religion in the world, right? There was a time. Right now, to be fair, and it's just a fact, um, Islam really is the most dangerous. It's not more dangerous because the Bible and the Quran are necessarily that different. New Testament is a little bit different. That's a little bit more hippie. It just uses the threat of eternal violence to manipulate you rather than violence right here. But the Old Testament and the Quran are, are, are very similar. But... More people adhere to the Quran more closely nowadays. It has more adherence, and it's uh, there are more people doing terrible things in the name of Islam today than there are um, in the name of Christianity or in the name of Judaism as it was in the past. So just like we focused on Christianity then, like there you had the Enlightenment thinkers, and you had Reform, and you had um, you know Rousseau, and you had Voltaire, and you had all these people. Um, in the same way, we need those Voltaires and Rousseaus for for Islam right now. That, that's the only way to move it forward, I think. So we'll open it up to the Q&A. First denim jacket that... <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm, um, can, can you take me one? Yes. My name is May. I'm a proud member of the group of ex of North America. We spoke about it too many times. It's all my innocent academic um, then I have a question um, about something you read, and maybe you did answer it in the book, but maybe you can help me understand. You said something about the free speech in the United States, and I think I remember you said even the hate speech is that like, people are allowed to say anything. Now, I have a problem with that to coincide it with the religious speech in, in the Muslim world. I see the problem we have with our new generation. Um, is it huge because of these, you know, uh, religious speech of imams and sheikhs? And if it comes to me, I would encourage the government to scrutinize <coughs> the curriculums that we have in the Islamic schools, for instance. How do I reconcile these two contradictions? No. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's unopposed. So, um, what you have, what you're talking about, if I understand correctly, is you're saying that there are in a lot of the Muslim majority countries, and you have people in the sermons at the mosques and yeah. the khutbahs and the school curriculums and all that. Right, and I in, in the book, oh, sorry, in the book I talked about um, some of the textbooks in Saudi Arabia, right? Even now that, that teach people to kill Jews and Christians and uh, fight the infidels and so on. So how do we I, um, should we curtail them because that's hate speech and. I think that the biggest problem with that is that there is no opposition to it. I think the best way to fight hate speech is with more speech. When you try to ban it, like, you know, if you try to ban um, religious speech, even a lot of these sermons and khutbahs, you make victims and heroes out of the people. <coughs> like, you know, the one thing they really want to know, they want to say we're oppressed, you know, our, fr our religious freedom you know, you're curtailing it, we're going to become victims. And that's, that's a narrative that they all thrive on. And it just doesn't work historically. It has never worked to give them that satisfaction. Right? Like, and, and I'll give you an example of what happened here at, uh, with Zunera Ishaq, who was the, you know, the lady who, who wore the veil. And you know, there's a controversy. Like, my wife thinks that she should not have been allowed to wear it. I think that once she was checked at security and she came in, it doesn't matter to me what she's wearing on her face as long as she's been cleared and her identity has been established. And that's what I said. I, I think that what um, a lot of the conservatives did at that time, they were going against it, they made her into a hero. There's a woman who covers her face and she is a hero in a free expression hero, a hero of free expression among a lot of liberals in Canada, right? And liberals are obviously the majority here. And, and she is now, now they celebrate her as an example of religious expression, free speech. She's the last person who deserves that status. You know, in the same way that the left does that too now with all the universities. Like Milo Yiannopoulos went and he you know, spoke at a university. They shut him down. They burned 
I don't know what they burned, they rioted, destroyed cars, and they got really violent, and then they made him a hero, and he doesn't deserve that status. So both <laughs> sides do this when they try to censor speech by force, or by law, or by, you know, any, any forceful method. So the way to fight bad ideas is with good ideas, and I think that um, if in, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but if in Saudi Arabia, if uh, somebody was producing those textbooks and, and there was actual freedom of speech where people felt that they could come up safely and say that we think those textbooks are wrong, we're going to change it, um, that is the best way to fight it rather than actually legislate. Can, I, can I just say yeah. one quick thing? So when you limit any form of speech, even the worst kind of speech, what you're doing is you're doing three things. You're making the you're giving the government the authority to limit speech, and you never know what next they're going to limit. Um, what, and also, you're you're a, pro, a problem that is not going to go away because you limited free speech is now going to be done <coughs> undercover, and you're not going to know how big of a problem it is to tackle it. And also, as Ali mentioned, you're going to uh, embolden these people to because when you limit certain kind of free speech, the you know, the victimhood narrative strikes back and you know they come back at you twice as hard. And it's not actually gonna work. You know, it's not gonna limit their free speech, it's just gonna drive it underground, which they're gonna go faster and without people knowing that it's actually a problem. Yeah. Um, black shirt in the back. Sorry, uh, I, uh, the how to, uh, so can you repeat the last part of it again? Yeah, how to really build opinion against uh, using religion as a political tool. Oh, um, I, I think the, just speak out as much as you can. That's, that's what I can think of. Well, I mean, or, I don't know if you could even do that because Islam is a very political religion. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very difficult to sort of separate Anytime, I mean, you can look at it from a very sort of broad uh, point of view. You can zoom out and you can look at anything that talks about punishment and reward based on your action is by definition automatically political. Then you have, you know, you have other levels like, for instance, in, in Judaism, there's claims on land and there is, you know, territorial distribution. That, that is by nature, and, and, and nationalism, I mean, that by nature is political. Then with Islam, you know, you, you have even sort of more of a fundamentalism in the sense that um, the Quran is supposed to be the infallible word of God, right? And when you have that, you that itself is inherently political. You can't separate politics out of the religion. And people use this to great advantage. I'll, uh, one quick example, and then Armin, you know, you can take it from there, the, is uh, recently, a few years ago, I don't know if it's still, I don't think it's still banned, but YouTube was banned in Pakistan after that movie Innocence of Muslims came out, you know, the one that led to the whole Benghazi um, incident in 2011. So they considered it blasphemous and the government said, we're gonna clamp down on blasphemy, we don't want blasphemy, so we're gonna shut down YouTube. Now the thing is, YouTube is a really important path or channel for political dissent against the government of Pakistan, right? So people who are politically opposed to them can use YouTube and all these, all these channels in, or, in order to get their word out. So if they say that, if they say we're just going to ban YouTube because we don't want political dissent, 
then the whole country will rise up against them. It's like, you're censoring us. But if they say, well, we're going to ban YouTube because there's too many blasphemous people are insulting our prophet, the entire country is like, yes, that's good. We, we're with you. And then next thing you know, all of your political dis dissent is squashed. So it's quite, it's quashed. Um, so, so they, they do use it and it's very difficult for the average person, I think, to pick it up. And, you know, you're, you're kind of seeing that, you see that here as well. I mean, religion is just a very, very easy tool that's readily available, um, where you get the agreement of a lot of people as well. Yeah. Okay. So the best way to get rid of Islam in politics is to get rid of Islam because Islam, I mean, if, if you're doing Islam and you're not doing politics, then you're not doing Islam right. Because if you just read the Quran, you can see this, this is a political book. If you read that, this is a political way of life. I mean, I didn't even understand before I came to Canada that people were like, oh, politics and religion should be separate. I'm like, what? Like, isn't religion the way you do politics? That's, you know, that's your guy. I mean, um, but, I mean, even before I came to Canada, I kind of heard it a little bit. But the, the idea of separating religion from politics is a very foreign concept for a lot of people. Um, especially, like, in Iran, everything has to pass a religious test before even, you know, they call it democracy, but... I mean, it is semi-democracy, but it has to p pass the religious test before it could even be set for people to selecting, you know, the democratic leaders and stuff. But even, you know, you just have to read the, if you read Muhammad's story, I think the reason why Christianity is as political is because Jesus was very unsuccessful with his, with his uprising, so we didn't get to see him as a leader, you know, but Muhammad was much more successful and he actually became the... Yeah, leader of all Arabs, so we got to see the political side of him, so now everybody has the political Muhammad as a role model on how to do politics, something we didn't get to see with Jesus. Um, because that's part of Muhammad being the leader, it was part of his life, and Muhammad is the role model of, of all humans and how to live, therefore politics must be part of mm -hmm. Islam. And, and this is, it's a little, I'm going to say, I think, one more thing is that it is a little bit complicated, like I'm listening to what you're saying, and, and it's confusing for some people because they're saying, well, in India has got the second largest population of Muslims in the world after Indonesia, yet, you know, they have achieved some semblance, I mean, it's not perfect, but some semblance of secularism. Uh, by secularism, that doesn't mean anti-religion, that just means that, you know, the religion and state have become separate. The same thing in the Western world for the most part in Canada and in the US, there are many Muslims who actually practice their religion or the parts of it they like, they cherry pick and uh, they practice it and without the politics, right? Then there's the argument that, well, that's because they're low, it's small in number, if they become large in number, then the politics starts taking over. And that is actually unfortunately true of, of um, it's been true of many religions in the past, but right now it's particularly true of Islam because it is so inherently scripturally political to Armin's point. So uh, it, there, there are many variables I, I think that, that play into it. But, um, but, the, but the best way to I think go against it is to speak out against it. I, I, I would love it if we didn't have any religion in the world. That'd be amazing. I think Armin's solution is great in that sense. I just don't think that's going to happen any t anytime soon. So. Um, I also don't think I agree with Armin that I don't think that you can reform Islam in in the way that many of our friends actually people who we really like and <coughs> know um, think it can. However, I, I don't think you can take the scripture. The people who are the most problematic and who know their scripture really well, like ISIS or you know, like they really really know. I mean, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi has a PhD. He he studied every word. He he actually knows the language of the Quran. He studied classical Quranic Arabic, so um, they, and the Hadith and everything. They they know it in a lot of detail. So if you go up to them and you're like, no, actually, you know, you have to interpret it differently. It's not beat your wife. It's kiss your wife. And you know, <laughs> if you if you start doing that, then they're eventually going. They're not going to believe you. Like the 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 ra the regular moderate Muslims. You know the um, the Indonesian ones, the Iranian ones, the ones who don't speak Arabic. They they will believe you. Uh, but those aren't the problem. 
The ones who are the problem are the ones who know. They're going to get out of here. What are you talking about? Like, I know this stuff. I mean, who are you? You don't even have a beard. You know, so <laughs> they're... So they... It's, I don't think that that's effective. But what you can reform is you can reform the way that... And this is another difference between ideas and people. You may not be able to reform Islam, but what you can reform is you can reform the way that people think. Uh, the way, you know, you have... When you have Muslims, if you have the education system, like, like you were talking about, if you... Talk about the scientific method. If you talk about how to process information, how to analyze it, how to how to you know critically um, it's critical thinking and some of those skills, you bring that into your education <coughs> system. You get people to think for themselves. I think that's something that can be reformed. And one religion that was just as political, even though there were much smaller numbers of them, and has a lot of parallels with Islam, even in its history, is Judaism. And Islam was actually. Pretty much, if you look at the Quran, you look at the Old Testament, the, the Quran was pretty much plagiarized, you know, from it. And, you know, I was, uh, like one thing I will say is that, you know, both of the prophets, they had a nickname Mo, you know, Moses and Muhammad. Neither of them liked foreskins. <laughs> they had, um, we've talked about the hostility to pork, right? And it's in their names, like Abraham, you know, Muhammad, Abraham <laughs> is in there. And I've, Jesus backwards is sausage. There's, they, they, I mean, there are a lot of commonalities throughout the Abraham, the, the story of Abraham and his son, and the political aspects of it, the corporal punishments, the punishments for punishment for adultery, the stoning to death and adultery is actually in the Old Testament. It's not even mentioned in the Quran. The reason it's not mentioned in the Quran is because there's a hadith of it was a eaten by a goat. Really. Eaten by a goat, because uh, Aisha apparently had the verses under her. Uh, pillow and a goat ate them. So this is an example of there's a there's an exegetic technique, a, a, a tafsir technique called nas, right, which is abrogation. Some people are familiar with it. Uh, this is, there are three types of it. This is the second type where the verse, uh, the meaning of the verse survives even though it's not physically in the Quran. And the rajam verse is the stone of death or adultery. They're apparently in that category. So, but anyway, that stuff aside, I'm we're kind of digressing here. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the way to change things is to change the way people process information, really to zoom out, talk about fundamental things, like instead of religion or, you know, what does this verse say, what does that verse say, you know, talk about um, the scientific method, about critical thinking, uh, how to process information, how to read critically. Um, those are the things I think that if we focus on, we zoom out. The very idea of faith, believing claims without evidence, um, you know, not glamorizing faith as a virtue. I mean, the, the, these are things that we can actually inculcate that are more universal and that I think human beings will relate to a lot more rather than... But, but this, this is a good way of reforming how people think. But what you notice that this is not a reforming of Islam. This is a reforming that involves ignoring Islam. Right, yeah. and all these Muslims that we say that uh, uh, we, that we, that's true that they're not political. They're not political not because they are they studied Islam and read the Quran and that the fact that it was political and they reformed the view their views uh, about what it says and now they're not political. No, these people are not political because they're ignoring Islam. This is an abandonment of Islam, not and a reform. This has happened version before. This has happened as with the other. Agreement. So, so even among Muslims that are not political, you you don't you can still be a Muslim and abandon a lot. Of, like ignoring Islam can be done by Muslims as well, not just by ex-Muslims, right? You just um, so what there, I just want to keep pointing out is that this is when when people are like, oh, look at these Muslims; they're not doing that. They're not doing that. Yeah, because they're ignoring Islam. So these examples does not mean that Islam doesn't say the things that Islam says, right? These, these examples show that progress involves ignoring Islam. And that's how the enlightenment happened for him. I just want to go to him because he drove three hours to get here. Thank you, man. Oh, <laughs> he told me that uh, in the hallway. Yeah,
But I got have a, a concern about that as well. So just recently there was a mom here in, uh, in Toronto who was basically saying that and cursing the Jews, right? Just imagine if that is being said constantly, uh, that's going to create an anti-Semitism. And sort of later, with enough numbers of idiots and morons, they're probably going to go ahead and, and it'll still harm on somebody who's a Jew or, or sort of like whatever the case is. I think that there's no place for this type of uh, speech here in the West, I'm saying here in the West, because that is hatred against uh, against a race, a specific race. And even though, and I think this is where it should be, there has to be a limit to free speech if it, if it attacks individuals and in race and so on and so forth, right? Um, again, you know, the, you know, Europe is reading because of the global jihadism, right? Allowing all these idiots to go walk in the street, and first the queen, and first the West, and secularism, and all that stuff. I mean, they keep saying this, and that's what we keep you know, seeing terrorists at that. Terrorism, right? Wouldn't you think that it's, it's, for, it's for the sake of safety of our Western culture that we need to stop these people from saying it? If they don't like it, kick them out. Just you stopping them saying right? these things is not going to change their views on it, though. Well, just kick them out because you know what? They're going around now, they're killing, they're killing, and you have people listening to that. That's sort of but weird. kicking people, here's the right? thing you could make borders against people, you can't make borders against <laughs> ideas, right? Kicking people out is not going to stop ideas from coming in. You have to challenge these ideas because, you know, immigration policies and everything is, is against humans. But people would, in the age of internet, ideas travel faster than people, right? You have to challenge these ideas more than you challenge the mo mobility of people. In fact, kicking these people out might actually help their cause. You know, you're actually putting more... If, if they come out in the open and they get ridiculed and challenged, you're more effective than giving them more attention, more victimhood mentality, more, um, but you know, in kicking them out will make them win the narrative that they're trying to sell, right? So, so here's the thing. I, I actually. So I don't want that guy on planet Earth. Forget this country. But there, there's. So th this is actually this is a point that gets to the heart of free speech, now, which is what the organizers of this conference are about, and this is that sort of borderline, what's really really tough. Right, to decide what is a threat and what isn't a threat. Incitement of violence, threats, you know, threats of physical harm, you know, that, those are, I, those have to be very, very direct to qualify. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, the South Park creators, right? They, you, you guys are familiar? Like they did that whole thing with the animated uh, Muhammad and then they blacked him out and you know, another time he showed up in a teddy bear suit and he was just, it was amazing. So they did all that. And uh, there, there was a group, there's a group in uh, New York City, um, a fundamentalist Muslim group that, that celebrated 9-11 every year. So they go out openly in the streets and celebrate. It's a very small group. Um, and one of them was actually a converted Jew. The other one was like just a, a, a Muslim. And uh, they had a website. And on the website... Uh, they posted a picture of Theo Van Gogh. Theo Van Gogh was uh, the filmmaker who was murdered uh, by jihadists for making a blasphemous movie. And, you know, he was the one where they stabbed him and they put a note there uh, threatening Ayan Hirsi Ali and saying that she was going to be next. And they put up that picture and they said to the South Park creators, like, you know, this could be you. And the question was, is that a threat? And that wasn't a threat. I mean, they, um, they, they said something like, this could happen to you, so be careful. Um, the, a threat actually happens when you say that I'm going to kill you. Uh, this is what I'm going to do to you. That would be a threat. But to say that, you know, just be careful, you know, this could happen to you, that's something my mom says that to, to me all the time. She's like, listen, you go out and do these, someone could, someone's going to come and do this to you. So the, it's indistinguishable from that. Um, and unfortunately, like as unfortunate as that is, I think it's right. Like, I, I actually think that, like, you know, when we're talking about the unopposed, we don't have, like, in Saudi Arabia, when you have, they have these textbooks, 
there's nobody out there who can speak up against them because it's blasphemy. They're scared to speak up. I think one of the reasons that all of this stuff has gone unchecked is because people are afraid to rise up against it. The way to combat that video is to put that video out everywhere. The video of the chutbah that you talk about in Masjid Toronto, right. right? And for those who are not familiar, this is a video where there's an imam who's reading a prayer. And this is actually a very common prayer that they read. It's, just, it's in Arabic, so people just go, I mean, I mean, and they, you know, they, they don't know what it means. But it was about, you know, just rid the world of the filth of the Jews. And you know, it was just really crazy stuff in it. Yeah. So when you, and, and the, the thing with this is, if this video comes out, if it's shared widely, and if people come up and they speak up against it, instead of calling me up and saying, listen, I'm a white guy, I don't want to be called a bigot, so, you know, please, you say it, I can't say it. That's the reason that this stuff is going unchecked. It's because it's unopposed. There's nobody rising up against it because of Islamophobia, phobia. People are scared to criticize it. And one thing I want to say is that people who don't do this and who don't speak up, you know, they think that they're curbing terrorism. Like, we don't want to criticize them because then we're going to create more terrorists. That's not true. The thing is, they're already victims of terrorism. If you see something that doesn't fit with your values, and you're too scared to speak up against it because of what might happen to you or how you're going to be labeled, that is how terrorism works. Terrorism isn't... The only victims of terrorism aren't necessarily the ones who've been blown up or killed. Everybody who decides to self-censor after the Charlie Hebdo thing happens and decides not to print the cartoons themselves because they may cause offense. The moment you do that, you have been terrorized. You are a victim of terrorism. Te that's how terrorism works. Can when, I, you, when you create Can terror. I respond? Okay, yeah. so uh, like, even if it was an actual threat, actual threat, kicking these people out of the country, other countries are not, are not out of space. It's on this planet still. Other countries are not the Western world's garbage yard. You know, you can't, it, there's just not, there is, there's, there's still someone else's problem, right? Like, if we don't want them. And they're if, on if, Twitter. If they won't, if they, if they're not good for us here in Canada, they're not good for people in Pakistan either. Where are you going to kick them out to, right? I mean, I'd rather them be here because I can talk about them. I'd be like, look, look at these idiots. Look at what they're saying. Like, hey, look, this is happening in your university. If it's Pakistan, people are like, well, it's in Pakistan. It goes unchecked, right? So I want more of them here. Bring them here so people can see <laughs> what kind of idiots, is, what these people are saying. Like, look, you think this is not happening in Pakistan? You think we're lying? Look at what these idiots are saying. Bring them here so you can see, so you can believe us, right? It's an unpopular view, but I, I understand. Yeah. Going to but, but you don't want them here because you don't want them here because they're you a threat. To send where he's coming you from don't want them here because they're a threat to you. But if you send them somewhere else, they're still a threat. These ideas are still a threat to somebody. That's why you have to fight the ideology. You can't let them get away with it because if you, that person is kicking them out, they're still going to have those views. You can't let they're, them get away with those ideas. They're actually still a threat to you too if you send them out. I'll give you an example. Another. Short example, Anwar al-Awlaki, lived in Yemen, okay, underwear bomber, watched his videos. The Boston Marathon bombers, right, who are, and anybody says they're racist, that they're from the Caucasus, well, that's where the word Caucasian comes from, so just in case we thought this is a racist thing. They're from there. Um, this guy, Nidal Farouk, uh, the guy who, uh, the army psychiatrist, who shot Fort Hood shooter, right, who watched the Anwar al-Awlaki videos. All of these guys, this guy Omar Mateen, who shot up Orlando, him. All of these guys have been watching his videos. He's an American citizen, this guy, Anwar He was in, uh, he got his PhD in Nebraska. Like, he's educated, he's not a dumb guy, he wasn't poor, he wasn't disenfranchised, nothing. He just had a lot of ideas. He put them on the, and he left the US, you know, he was in Yemen, and his ideas still have a chokehold on anybody who wants to listen to it in the United States. ISIS has a Twitter presence. They have a, but, but a deep web presence. Like their ideas, you can send them out there, but unless you're North Korea and you're, you know, movies against, you know, protectionism versus globalization, you can't get away from globalization unless you're North Korea and you ban the internet in your, in but, your, but, in your even, but even if they weren't a threat to you, ever, if once you kick them out, they're never, even if that was true, they were never a threat to you, right? 
The thing is that there are threat to, these ideas are a threat to other people that are living on this planet. Let's not try to save our country. Let's try to save our planet. We're, this is a global battle. We're in this to get, We're all in this together. Right? It's not about Canada or United States. It's about saving everybody. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start right here. Okay, great. Hi guys, my name is Sam Sima and uh, I am a student Muslim and uh, I want to say uh, something. Uh, if if uh, my translation is good, uh, sorry for that. Uh, there is a difference between uh, Islamism and Islam. And because right now I am Muslim, I uh, call it radical Islam. Uh, dear Arman, fighting uh, with idea with the freedom of speech is a good thing. But freedom of speech don't help people under ISIS in Iraq. Freedom of speech don't uh, uh, help uh, people in Iran, in our country. Uh, I mean that we need responsible government. Yes, fighting with idea is a good thing. But you should fight with the terrorism right now. What is the difference between, uh, for example, uh, some guy like Justin Trudeau send the people water and a blanket or something like that. Dude, the bombing in, uh, in the top of the people. They are killing the uh, children. They are killing. They are enslaving the women. You, we are talking about freedom of speech. No. At this point, we need to fight with terrorism in the air, in the sea, and the earth. And second thing, 50 years ago, do we have a radical? Islamic terrorism or jihadists in the West 50 years ago, 100 years ago, no. This year, YouTube, Twitter, and the media, the, the terrorists and the, the radical Islamists or Islamists using that in favor of uh, themselves. You gave a good example. We have a homegrown terrorist. This is a uh, new phenomenon. And the other thing, 40 centuries ago, you know and I know that, Islam was three people, Muhammad, Ali, Khadij. Yeah? Nobody was Muslim. And after that became 40 people. And after that became one population, Hijab. After that, one country. After that, one region. Islam is not a Christianity or Buddhism or Baha'i. Islam is an offensive religion. We have two important Eid in Islam. You know that. One of them after Ramadan and the other is tens of the mm. Hajjah. Urban and Fet. Is there a direct question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just one. We have a two Eid in Islam. Do you know and I know and I want the other to know that. We pray the Salat in front of everyone. Why? Because when I say we, I mean Muslim. Muslims pray in the, in the public area. Why they want to treat them kufa? Okay? You cannot uh, just uh, stop Islamism with freedom. You need a responsible government and sometimes you need law to some research. Alright, so first of all, um, Islam and Islamism are the same thing. Um, the way to, people try to separate Islam and Islamism as if you know, Islam is a watered-down version, and the thing is, if you read the Quran and Hadith, the way to do Islam is the way Islamists do it. So, you know, just separating the the po political and part of Islam as Islamists and not Islam is not being true to, not understanding the true nature of Islam. Another thing is that I hear a lot, like, people say, like, oh, tackling ideas is not going to save people that are being attacked by ISIS. It's not an either or situation. You know, when you, you can need to do both. One of them is a short term investment, the other one is a long term investment. If, if, if your city is being attacked by ISIS, obviously we're not going to go and start starting a speech for the attackers trying to save people. No, we get the, get the generals in there to start bombing the shit out of these people to make sure that they don't advance to the city. The thing is that while they do that, we're trying to make a longer term investment in, um, in solving the solution while these are quick fixes. And, but 
but another thing, we talk about ISIS and terrorists when we talk about Islam as if that's the main cost of Islam. Islam fucks with us in many different ways than just terrorism, okay? And that's just the most visible one that gets the most attention, but the cost of Islam and religion and faith and dogma in general is way, way more and, than just terrorism. And I think the reason why terrorism gets a lot of attention is because that's the way these, in the West we feel it most and we just care, start talking about Islam when there's a terrorist attack because now it's affecting us. But we don't give a shit when people have to live under this Islamic tyranny for for all their life and their, their life is being influenced by it every day. That's, we don't care about that. We, only when it's affecting us, all of a sudden we start talking about it. But, you know, you, uh, Islam and Islamism and um, the way it affects people's lives, what you wear, who you love, who you can be, what you can say, who you can elect, um, what you can eat. Uh, you know, 3,000 gay people have been hanged in Iran for simply being gay. You know, people, there's so many, you know, misery caused by dogma and superstition and religion and faith in general that, that doesn't involve somebody blowing up somebody else. And, 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 you know, I think it's very selfish for us to all of a sudden just talk about these things when, it, we were like, when we're scared and all of a sudden stop talking about it when we're not afraid. I mean, I, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are not the main harms of Islam. Right? Yeah, it's a, and it just to add to that really quick, a way to visualize this, what you're thinking is that, you know, you have twigs and leaves on a tree, then you have a trunk, you have roots. So I always kind of think of like, you know, if you're just cutting off the twigs and you leave the roots in the trunk intact, it's, it's not going to help. But you still need to do that though. I mean, you, you do need to do that, but you have to get the other side. I think what we're doing, a lot of the Western approach has been just to, to just trim the twigs and everything and leave the roots intact but there is a there's there's jihadism there's violent jihadism um that's related to islam yeah. the religious ideology and we everybody says oh it has nothing to do with islam it absolutely does and that's something that we have to fight the battle um of ideology and that's where the free speech aspect comes in and further than that zoomed out further there's this idea of faith believing things without evidence that is considered you know, a, a, some sort of virtue. You know, people, like I believe that, you know, a virgin gave birth just because, you know, billions of people believe it and just because it's in a book written by somebody else. But faith by definition is a really ridiculous thing because it means that, it, that you actually celebrate the fact that, well, do you have faith? Yeah, but where's the evidence? So there's no evidence. If you have true faith, you just believe. You don't need the evidence. And that's celebrated. That's, crazy. I mean, I don't have faith this chair exists because I'm sitting on it. I know it exists, right? I, there's evidence of it. But when you get people to, you know, everyone's like, it's fake news, and why is everybody believing fake news? Why did people believe what Trump said in the campaign? Well, you know, you have people who believe, there's adults, educated adults who believe in transparent white angel things flying around everywhere that believe in jinns and flying horses and um, you know, evil eyes and all these, all these things that have absolutely no evidence for them. When you prime that, this is another problem with the whole reform aspect, is that when you prime people to think that way, that faith is a good thing, believing claims without evidence is a good thing, you can get them to believe anything. Mm. Even if you prime them with a good version of it. Even if you have a really peaceful religion. If, if it's false, and if you have many people who are, and you're celebrating them believing something that's false, even if it's a good thing, if it's Jainism or something, even then, the process that's required to believe something that's false, or that has no evidence, is the same process that can ultimately be exploited to get people to believe terrible things. And, and, right? and, and, and well, people don't get that because I, whenever people talk about Islam and the cause of Islam, they always mention Al-Qaeda and ISIS and... But the, to me, that suggests that if this was, if Al Qaeda and ISIS and terrorism wasn't there, we wouldn't see Islam as a problem. But it is a problem, right? If you believe in bullshit without evidence for bullshit, then you're gonna you're gonna be conned. People are gonna take advantage of you. They're gonna make you vote in a certain way or do certain things that is not in your best interest. It, you know, this is, and it like I said, if you believe in things without evidence, at some point you it's gonna harm you, your you or someone else, and. 
it you know sometimes Islam doesn't harm anybody else but yourself. I mean, the main victims of Islam are Muslims who believe in it, and even if you're not hurting anybody, if if it's just costing you, your your personally, uh, it's still a harm, right? Even if you don't blow people up, like you, and you know, when when there's a terrorist attack, they count the victims, but they always are missing one victim. The main victim was the person that blew himself up because that person was a victim way before the day of the attack because that person's life was hijacked by this ideology for, for you know, all the, the people that dedicate all their life to religion because of an afterlife and they're not going to get it. All these lives are wasted. But we're not counting it as a cost because they're not hurting anybody. They are hurting us. They're hurting themselves. Yeah, and the, the indoctrination is very powerful. I'm going, to, I'm, going to go, I'm going to tell, I'm going to try to make this short, but this is a story uh, that I actually start the book with, just to show how powerful the indoctrination is. And the story is I was in fifth grade, I was 10 years old, and I was in a class, I went to an American school in reality, and, and our teacher had us make snowflakes, right, Not actual real snowflakes, uh, from paper. And so, you know, we'd, uh, it was a winter vacation, you know, we folded up the circular piece of paper, we cut into them, you open it up, and it's a snowflake, right? And then we decorated them, she put them on the wall. And it, because it was an American school, uh, what, in Saudi Arabia what happened is the Ministry of Education, their government guy would go to all the foreign schools and make sure that they were complying, right? They weren't doing anything too crazy. Uh, so he came and he saw the snowflakes and he got really angry and he got a pair of scissors and he cut one of the tips off of each of the snowflakes. And, you know, I was... So that was 10 or 11, you know, 20 other kids in the class who were super confused. We had no idea what this guy's doing. He's like, you know, why is he cutting a tip? Or what, what offended him about the snowflakes? And then the teacher had to explain to us uh, that it has six points, like the Star of David. And that's how I was introduced to the Jews. Okay? <laughs> like that's, how, that's how I found out what Jews were. I went home, and that's my dad. About these Jews. My dad was, you know, he, then he started telling me about the Israel-Palestinian conflict. We got, he brought down some maps of, that we'd gotten from a bookstore in Riyadh, so it didn't have Israel on the map. It wasn't on the map. Um, so he couldn't even teach it to me properly. And that was just one day. And I was like, okay. Well, nothing like that really happened. It was one day in fifth grade. I went through the rest of my schooling. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I'm in Mississauga. And I came here and um, uh, my family started, they bought a convenience store. So me and my brother were working at the convenience store because we had no idea. We're like, oh, brown people in convenience store. It was just completely <laughs> normal. Um, and we did that for a summer. And this guy walked in and he was talking to me about, and I was, I was studying. Uh, it was in summer. I, I was going to med school in, in Karachi at the time. So I was just studying for an exam. And, uh, you know, he started asking me about his kid. You know, his kid was doing medicine and so on. So, and he sounded like he had an Arabic accent, right? So I talked to him, and then he told me that his son was back in Israel, back home in Israel. And I found out he was Israeli, and he was a Jew. And I went into fight or flight mode, okay? I had nothing against Jews. My parents were completely rational. Nobody taught me anything. But just living there... For 11 years in Saudi Arabia, I met my first declared Israeli Jew. And I freaked out. Like, I clenched my fists. I became, like, you know, I started sweating. My voice started shaking. I was trying to force smiles. It was completely involuntary. I got mad at myself. I started talking myself out of it. And it's like, oh, hey, come on. You know, you love Woody Allen movies. Woody Allen's great. <laughs> and, you know, Einstein, who's a hero. And, and I'm trying to tell myself these things. And he could obviously see it on my face. Because yeah, I felt like I was in a crossway second going. <clears throat> and I had that reaction. That, then eventually, you know, he, he was leaving. He, I think he freaked out. And then he's like, okay, bye, I'm leaving. And, you know, I went out and I had a cigarette with him. And we had a conversation. I told him what happened. And that's the first time I, I had that experience. But that's how, what the indoctrination was like. Now, that was one guy who came in one day when I was going to school, um, and that's the exposure that I had. But the same guy who cut the tips off the snowflakes, he was only in my school for one day, but he is from the Ministry of Education, so he writes the textbooks 
of all the Saudi kids. First grade, second grade, every single day they are exposed to what I was exposed in that one day. So if that limited exposure made me react the way I did, can you imagine what these people grow up with and what they think? And that's not, that's not Islam, and that's Islam, because it's, a, it's in the Hadith and in the Quran that you're supposed to hate the Jews. Yeah, it's not, this is Islam, this is not Islamism, it's Islam. And just one last point, one example uh, that I want to give about how religion could make things. When I, when, I was a, um, when I was a teenager, I tried to kill myself to avoid hell, because I wanted to die as a pure child to make sure that there's no way I would end up in hell. This isn't, I did, this would not hurt anybody else other than me. This is an ideology that convinced me that I needed to do this. And it almost cost me my life. Mm. All right, can you, if this is really important, can you explain the, the part of the ideology, the fact that before you're 15, you're masum, right? Yeah. You're innocent, so you cannot go to hell. So if you... So why stay around and see if you're going to make it to heaven or hell? I was like, this is an obvious loophole that I could just quit. I could just quit early and make sure... Okay, in Islam, suicide is a sin, but nothing is a sin before 15 for boys, 9 for girls. So like... <laughs> so like, well, I'm going to just check out and make sure I'm going to go to heaven. Like, I, this is a very dangerous gamble. Yes, I know I'm going to be a good Muslim now, but who knows how I'm going to be later. I might change, right? Why would I stick around and take the chance? Yeah. I'm just going to make, give myself guaranteed heaven. So I jumped out of the window, right? I, I wasn't successful, but... but Thankfully. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> But, but here's the thing though, given the premises, given the premises, I still think that was a logical conclusion. And this is why ridiculous premises, even with logical analysis, can give you ridiculous conclusions. Right? And this is the problem with, when we have it, there's not like, oh, well, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. No! You give people ideas that are not backed by anything, they're going to come up with a conclusion that is going to somehow, at some point, hurt somebody. Either their, themselves or, or the entire community or the country or uh, somebody else. Yeah, and for more of this, I mean, this story is incredible if you hear what led up to it. It's actually um, in the first episode of our podcast, him and Yas, the, yeah, Yasmin Mohammed, the one who I told you about, uh, who's married to the Al-Qaeda guy, they, they both go into a lot of detail about their story, so make sure you listen to that episode. All right, guys, we only have a time for a few more questions, so we'll try to keep the questions and answers. And answers, short answers, short answers. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll start. Yeah. I'll be on the podcast uh, later next month, so. All right. Oh, yay. Very nice. Um, so I have a question. Um, I'm from Benghazi, Libya. Mm -hmm. That same city you know about. Everybody yeah. Knows about. So I've seen firsthand what Democrats... You have Hillary's emails? I have some emails. So, I've seen firsthand what Democrats have done to the city and how they've dealt with the, what happened in Benghazi and how they denied it. I've seen Democrats try to hide it, criminally hide it, to hide evidence of what they've done. The guys who, were, who killed the ambassador were meeting him the day before. That was the, the, the policy of the you asked them to meet Islamists and militias in Libya and to meet Islamists and normalize them to as they, they're not extremists. And literally 24 hours later, they killed the ambassador himself as the movie and the, to try to like show what like, you meet us, you meet Islamists, okay, we're going to kill you. And a few later, years later in Manchester, the Libyan kids were killed now. You've seen what they've done. Yeah. His father was, was fighting in Libya in militias and Islamists by Democrats, and, and you can see the, the link directly like with Democrats supporting. Now, I'm talking about what liberals, like liberals in general. I'm talking about Islamists being supported by liberals and Democrats, and it's becoming criminals. It's not even becoming a matter of opinion. They're like not saying Islam is a religion, they're saying 
this was art, not white, and they're taking it to another level. Do you, it, do you want to ask how should we? Yeah, the question, how should we? Your, your turn. So the question, how should we? I'm not a not a Republican. I hate I hate conservatism and I hate I hate Donald Trump. I, I love the environment. I I don't want to be conservative, but at the same time. How can we face the Democrats and how can we face the liberals who so, are fighting for being like this? Um, so they're so pushing us away. They're pushing us no, away. I, I, I just have By making your own platform, just make, that's what they do. Secular journalism, yeah. yeah, secular journalism. I, is not, you don't take, you don't have to uh, support one group or another. Just make uh, your own uh, views. You don't, you don't have to, you know, you don't. It's not either or. There's not just two options, right? There's so many different ideas. So many I different. Can I, well, so I hear that that's what I was going to get to. Yeah, speaking of uh, not having the, the two sides thing, this isn't actually unique to the Democrats and the liberals. I mean, so I, I am completely with you on the hypocrisy of liberals nowadays. I, the whole chapter, the chapter I read from is, is called Islamophobia, Phobia, and the Regrets of Left, which is a term that was coined by Majid Nawaz for liberals, just like the ones that you're talking about. However, the word mujahideen comes from jihad. It means people who wage jihad. These people were hoisted to the level and the stature of the founding fathers by Republican administrations like Ronald Reagan. We know, and everybody says it all the time, I know it's an apologist argument, it's actually true, is that Osama bin Laden was part of the mujahideen. He trained under them as part of the CIA. It came back and it bit them in the ass. Same kind of thing has happened. Huh? It, it did. I, I'm just, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the U.S. has had this policy of uh, that there are uh, dictators in the Middle East. Uh, there, there are, they have had to choose, they've tried to choose the lesser evil every time, both Republican and Democratic administrations, okay? Um, you could argue that, I mean, the damage that was done in Benghazi, I think what happened in Afghanistan in the 80s with Ronald Reagan, um, you could argue that that was even worse. I, I think that they're both the same, but they, they were, they, this is a problem that's not just with uh, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, this is a problem of trying to pick out moderates. So we have to find the moderates. They tried to do that in Syria, they tried to do that in Afghanistan, as you said, they tried to do that in Libya. Um, they tried to actually do that in, in Egypt, you know, like, oh, we want a democratic process, and I mean, like, people vote in the Muslim Brotherhood, like, wonderful, and then, like, now what are you? So there is a, this has always been a problem in U.S. foreign policy, like, from, from I, think we're, we're we're gonna, I think we need, I think need to move on. Who should I <laughs> Let's go for one question. Yeah, we're going to move on to the next question. Right yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Amanda. Hi. Um, I always saw you guys on the computer screen, so we're excited to see you in person. Um, I have a question about identity, um, moving away from... Yeah. Um, I'm from Bangladesh, and recently there has been, uh, in the news, a toppling of a certain statue, and has been moved to another place, which, you know, is a, a less more hidden place. And the statue is of a Bengali lady in a sari wearing, uh, she's holding the just scales of justice. And um, so now that statue is considered to be an idol, and, and also um, certain communities have called upon the government to remove more idols of this kind. Like, I'm assuming they'll eventually um, extend to the Shohi Binar, which is um, a symbol of independence, and um, um, even things like um, things that have been secular about Bangladesh, like our connection to Rabindranath Tagore, um, Bangladeshi dances. Um, our wedding ceremonies have a guy Holud, which has Shiva ceremony um, in origin, and... Yeah, this is, this is actually very similar to Pakistan, exactly, where we have absolutely. a lot of sort of Hindu traditions, and, and yeah. recently they had a kite flying festival called Basant, and then they banned that, and they yeah. had all these... Yeah, was, yeah, no fun, right? <laughs> no money yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and even, I think I wear some baby mm. anymore, I wear my saris differently now, I have to like cover way more than I used to, like things have changed, you can't say, um... Can't say al khalafis anymore. Have to say Allah hafiz now. Now this is my question to you. Um, I know you touched on it earlier, Ermin. Uh, you mentioned um, in Iran you have that the two identities. You have um, the Islamists like Khomeini, and then you have um, you know people who have connect themselves to that Zoroastrian past, to that Western language, to um, uh, to Navraz, things like that. Things are said. So the, in Bangladesh we call Shah, which is based on. Uh, 
or the Bengali calendar, which is connected to the Sanskrit calendar. Mm -hmm. So we have all these connections. Even in, in Bangladesh's history, the language itself was almost, you know, eradicated because it was not Muslim enough. It's a not Muslim enough dialogue. And now yeah. this dialogue is now preventing us from... Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm getting to my question. Yeah. Um, how can we fight... Um, how can, because Islam is very somewhat new to these countries, to Bangladesh, to Indonesia, so their identities are still being formed, still being shaped. So now more and more people are flocking to the Islamic identity. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing. Like, why? How is, is it? So your question: How do we resist it, that? Yeah, and is it only your colonialism? Is it also backlash from the right wing? Like, what is it that forced my mom to say she's like now wearing the hijab for the first time in like my 24 years of existence? Like, people are flocking harder and harder to the religion. And people like me are getting, like, I used to get away with saying some, you know, like, maybe this is not legit. And we were like, okay, you can put it in here. But now it's like, <gasps> and I was in Bangladesh the year before I think the chief boy died, and I, I told people openly mm. I was naked. I think, I can't you want to start? I, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something that I think when I saw it change, and again, I wrote a lot in the book, um, is that when I was younger, and we didn't have the internet, like, which is, very, very long time ago, <laughs> very long time um, We had, uh, so we lived in, in Riyadh, so, you know, Riyadh is obviously as conservative as it is now, but uh, we had the Quran at the highest level of the shelf. It was in Arabic, none of us understood Arabic, and this is an important thing, we could read and write Arabic, but we never understood it, and this is a case, right, so that, this is a case in, in the Muslim world overall, the largest Muslim populations in the world, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Iran, Turkey, like these are non-Arabic speaking um, nations. The largest Arab country in the world is Egypt. That's a, about 80 million people. That comes further down the list. So, um, but the Quran was there and we couldn't touch the words unless we did an ablution ritual, which is a washing ritual called wudu. Um, if women were menstruating, they couldn't touch the Quran. We did everything. We recited it. The, 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 you know, people would recite it in Ramadan prayers. Uh, we would pray in Arabic, not understand anything. When our uh, someone would finish reading the Quran in Arabic, a kid, we'd have a celebration. We'd hold it over, over the heads of brides and grooms as they as they left the house when they got married. Nobody knew what was in it, and we were taught that the first revelation is read. Nobody understood what was in the Quran. Now, so when someone told me for the first time, do you know that, oh, you know, in, in Islam, you can have, you can have sex with uh, your slaves, even if you're not married to them. I'm like, what are you talking about? No, no, the Prophet did it. It's, it's in the Quran. I'd have to go to the Quran, I'd have to get my paper back, and I'd have to look through all of it, and I'd have to find the verse, it would take hours once I found the verse. There are four verses, by the way. When I find the one verse, I go ask somebody about it, they're like, oh, it's out of context, or this is the wrong translation, this guy who translated it used to be a Jew, you know, that, <laughs> and he converted. And there was always something or another, there was some excuse, and it was really hard. Now, if I want, if someone on Facebook says, you know, Islam endorses sex slavery, or uh, Islam doesn't endorse sex slavery, that's a lie, I can go to Google, I can find those four verses, just with a simple search, I can find them in Arabic where I can hover the mouse over each word and it will tell me the literal translation. I can go to a website where there are five or six different translations from Shias, about 12 from Sunnis, and, and so on. I can, any 12-year-old kid can do keyword searches and find what's in there. It's exposed. At that time, it wasn't. It was a mystery. All I knew of Islam was what my parents told me. My parents told me all this stuff the Saudis do. Beheading in the public saying yeah, it's not Islamic. I was like, oh, it's not Islamic. Okay. Then I read it and I was like, oh, okay, so that's kind of Islamic. Yeah. It's actually in there, the beheading. Um, and Kathy Griffin read the same book, I think. <laughs> um, so the, the, um, I think that that has a huge effect. And, and what that did was now you're seeing a lot of, like what we're having right now in the late 80s, early 90s, there was one guy. Salman Rushdie, you have to go into hiding, you know, for this. Th this whole thing was not possible at that time. Okay, and this, this discussion right now that we're having, you know, this is after a very long time, 
And a lot of people have read that and they've gone in our direction. Unfortunately, there are other people who read it and they went in ISIS's direction. They're looking for consistency. They look at something, they're like, well, my parents told me the Quran is infallible. My parents from a generation had no idea what was in the Quran. They just knew it was infallible. Now I'm seeing what's in it. If I still think my parents thought it was, you know, what my parents said is infallible, I'm going to go join ISIS. If I don't, if I think this stuff is ridiculous, I'm going to reject it completely. Or I'm going to be sort of in the middle of like the Majid Nawaz territory where, you know, I'm sort of tiptoeing around it. Um, so there's a, uh, I, I think that has had a lot to do with it. Like people are now looking at the Arabic, they're understanding the language, and they're following it more closely. You're seeing more hijabs, you're seeing more uh, people saying Allah Hafiz instead of Allah Hafiz. And you're, correct. I, I think that has a lot to do with it, yeah. Actually, can I, can I warn against this? I mean, I, I could talk about Iran more, I understand it a little bit more, but I think it's, I think we shouldn't try to fight identity with a different identity. The, this is something that I have a, what kept me in, you know, in Iran there's a big anti-Islamic sentiment among the liberal class, but I have a hard time getting close to those people, and this is very, a lot of my Iranian fans are probably abandoned, going to abandon me after saying these things. But I think in Iran, for example, you have this liberal, nationalist, a romanticized version of view of how Iran was before Islam's glorified Persian Empire, and then, but I also see that they have their own identity, and their anti-Islam views is not oh, this is why Islam is wrong, it is, we're looking for evidence and there's no evidence, so Islam is not... No, this is identity. And it's actually pretty racist as well. In Iran, anti-Arab racism is very common. It's like, in fact, it's unusual if you don't have it. And... Is, they hate us too. And, and the Arab and the anti-Islam views in Iran is also is an anti-Arab view. And you have, the view is that you have these, you had this Persian empire that was apparently perfect in every way, and you had these barbarians, Arabs came and they, with this back for ideology, and they came and, and you know, I asked these Zoro people that thought Zoroastrianism was the biggest thing, I asked them about Zoroastrianism, and they had no idea what this religion was about. They just think it was the best. It was the best thing that could have been, and, but they had no clue. They just know uh, w one part of it. Like just say, say what is good and do what is good. They just want, you go, yeah, go yeah. But they have a better understanding. But but, but, the, but the thing is that you know I don't want uh, you know I, it sounded similar. Like I'm I'm not sure, I, but I don't. I, the thing is that call okay. I have no problem with if 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 Islam was just a was is a religious a dogmatic religion. But if it was a culture and coming out coming to your country and changing your your culture, that's what happens. Cultures change. New cultures come. Change culture. That's not what's happening. Islam. Islam is a ideological you know invasion. But if it was if but I would the the thing is that when you have a problem with culture changing, this is an this is an identity battle. I don't want to fight Islam by saying, oh, this is an Islam identity, this is our secular identity, we are, this, this identity is better than our identity. That's not a battle worth fighting. The battle, of, the battle of ideology with Islam is like, look, this book is saying that, this, and it's clearly bullshit. If you think it's not bullshit, give me some evidence or some reason for me to believe in it. If you don't, I'm going to call bullshit on it, right? That's, you want to fight an idea, you don't want to fight people's ide identity, and in Iran, that's what that's what is happening. You have two separate identities, and that's they just they just claim superiority as, as people, as who you are. As we have Muslims, you have religious people, and you know here's one quick example of how how it is how bad it is in Upper Tehran, right? My mom, when when she was still alive in Tehran, she went to the bank, and there was this Chaudhuri lady with full hijab. She kept on asking the, tell asking the tellers the question, and the tellers were ignoring her. And she kept on trying to get one person to ask her a question, and everybody was ignoring her. Eventually, my mom grabbed her hand and took her to the teller, and she's like, can you please answer her question? And then they, they did, and she left. 
And my mom was like, why are you being so rude to this lady? And she's like, they all would tell her, she's like, these fucking religious people just ruined our country, right? And this is, up, people don't believe that this is happening in Tehran. This is upper Tehran, but then you go to Qom, and you get a completely different experience, right? This is not, about, this is not, oh, I, I disagree with this lady because she's, I, I, I believe in secularism, she believes in Islam. No, this is, no, I hate this person because she's religious, right? And that's the anti-Islam movement that is in Iran right now, and that's not the fight I want to be associated with. All right, um, I'm sorry. We are running out of time. We have run out of time, actually. We've gone a little over. So I think we'll have to end the Q&A there. Um, so I wanted to thank, again, Armin and Ali for coming out. You can give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few things. So books are being sold there, The Atheist Muslim, if you'd like, on your left, my right, um, as you exit. Additionally, a note for students in support of free speech. Later this June, on June 28th, we will be hosting an event called the Canadian Freedom Summit. And if any of you have heard, you know, Ben Shapiro, we'll be bringing him to Toronto. So keep your eye out for that event if you'd like to come. Uh, tickets are still on sale. Uh, and... With that, have a good night. Thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, that'll be all.